Room 29. This is the members is apologies. Are members aware of any apologies? Clark, everyone here? Yeah, yes, okay. Apology. Okay, thank you. Agenda item three, members, is chairperson's business. Can I refer members to a record of our informal meeting, <coughs> excuse me, with Colin McGrath, MLA, and the British Heart Foundation on his private member's bill to place a duty on the Department of Education for the mandatory provision of CPR training in post-primary schools in Northern Ireland at page six and ask members if they're content to note this briefing. Agreed? Content, Chair. Okay. I think members were supportive of those proposals. It's uh, in principle, it, it's fair to say. And obviously, uh, if and when the bill becomes uh, at the, the floor of the Assembly, um, the, the committee will give that full and proper and timely consideration. Agenda item 3.2 is our informal meeting with Apple. Can I refer members to a record of an informal meeting with the Apple education team at page 8 and ask members if they are content to write to the Department of Education asking what proportion of students in Northern Ireland have access to devices on a one device per child basis, perhaps also to seek an update with regards to the internet <coughs> connectivity um, of schools and areas across Northern Ireland in that regard, as the, the key theme emerging from that meeting was if, if we're to deliver equal educational opportunity, then we need to deliver equal access to device and internet connectivity. Members content to agree that, agreed? Just a little bit more specific uh, in the question, Chair. What type, yeah, just, device, what type of device? The phone doesn't cost you the device for learning from. Okay, so an appropriate, appropriate device. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, then, members. Agenda item three point three uh, is the, our committee motion on restraint and seclusion and our informal meeting on committee motions and forward planning. Can I thank members for your participation in the education committee motion to the assembly <clears throat> on restraint and seclusion and refer members to some media coverage of the committee motion in tabled papers. Um, I, I thought it was a, an extremely important, extremely constructive uh, motion. Um, it was great to see such a united response um, and to see the Assembly support the proposals that we were making in terms of mandatory training or statutory guidance, mandatory training, mandatory recording and reporting and abolition of isolation rooms. Um, as, as I said, it was obviously a combination of a lot of engagement with families, uh, with Children's Commission, with NIPSO, with, with other bodies. Um, so I, I think it, it was an uh, important piece of work by the Education Committee and, and one that we will obviously monitor to ensure implementation uh, of those recommendations in a, in a timely manner. Can I also advise members that a short report of our informal meeting on future motions and planning will be provided at next week's meeting. Okay, members, agenda item four is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting on 19th of May at page 11 of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. There are no matters arising, members, which allows us to proceed to agenda item six our General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland Chair and Vice Chair oral briefing. Can I ask committee broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a clerk's brief in tabled papers? A briefing paper from GTC NI Chair and Vice Chair at page 79 and Department of Education responses on GTC NI at pages 83 and 86. Can I welcome then Mr. Brendan Morgan, Chair of the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland, and Ms. Siobhan McElhinney, Vice Chair of the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland. You're both very welcome. Can I advise you that the committee can give you up to 10 minutes to make opening remarks, and this will be followed by questions from the members. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, thank you for inviting us along here today, uh, myself and Siobhan. Um, we are both full-time classroom teachers registered with GTCNI, but today we're here as Vice Chair and Chair of the General Teaching Council of Northern Ireland. Uh, our understanding is that, that this is a follow-up of the evidence provided to you on the 24th of March uh, by Alison Chambers of the DE and Alan Boyd of DE and the GTC and I's registrar, Mr Sam Gallagher. From the outset, I, you may be aware that I was not uh, invited to accompany Mr Gallagher uh, to appear before the committee on the 24th of March, as Mr Gallagher preferred to appear on his own. Before I begin my evidence, I would first of all like to acknowledge the tar tireless work that has gone on behind the scenes at GTCNI uh, by the staff and council members on the approval of teacher qualifications by applicants to GTCNI, the accreditation of educational qualifications delivered by our universities here, and the recent work on learning leaders uh, by GTCNI working group led by one of our council members and supported by our own senior education officer, Mr Jerry Devlin. Thanks also uh, to the small and dedicated registration team for all their continuing hard work to ensure that applicants to GTCNI are efficiently registered. Despite all this uh, excellent work, the committee will be aware of our concerns as I provided a comprehensive briefing paper to you last week. I do not intend to rehearse all, my, uh, all our concerns in detail, but I do want to provide a summary of those positions. Uh, I was confirmed as elected chair of GTCNI in December 2019. The organisation was already in special measures for a second time at that stage. Some appointed members on council refused to recognise the authority of the chair of council. Some appointed members refused to communicate directly with the vice chair or I outside of council meetings. Another council member refused to answer my questions in relation to work which they undertook on behalf of the council. Some appointed members in council remain opposed to the independent investigation into breaches of the Nolan principles, even though elected teachers on the council carried a majority vote uh, for an investigation into wrongdoing. Some appointed members were opposed to openly answering specific questions in a protected disclosure from the Office of the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. I know that ordinary classroom teachers who pay 95% of the GTCNI registration fee for its income, will be very disappointed to learn that elected teachers in GTCNI, who are there to represent their interests, are being undermined in this way. Two NIPSA staff surveys and an internal HR staff survey have hi highlighted serious concerns of alleged management bullying and harassment within the organisation. Some staff have since left under voluntary exit scheme, but GTCNI still faces the prospect of three industrial tribunals, a redundancy hearing, one grievance complaint and a disciplinary complaint. In my original paper to you, I had cited that there were two grievance complaints, but uh, subsequent to that, another member of staff has indicated that they are leaving the organisation. I'm, I'm, I'm not included in, in legal discussions currently relating to the industrial tribunal cases that have taken place against the organisation. And as I outlined my briefing paper, the registrars prevented the vice chair and I from seeking legal advice in areas that we feel might bring some clarification and certainty to the council to help resolve difficulties, difficult issues facing it. In 2019 and 20, 112 whistleblowing complaints were made to the Department of Education. These were investigated by the department's head of internal audit, who, who is also head of the internal audit for GTCNI. The report was withheld from GTCNI by DE officials. Council members are pro prohibited from even being allowed to see the terms of reference for this whistleblowing investigation. The GTCNI internal audit gave an overall limited, limited assurance on GTC, GTCNI's 2018 and 2019 annual report and accounts, and the situation continues to deteriorate. Unsatisfactory internal audit reports exist in relation to information management, business continuity planning, project management, and overall control and risk management and governance. Members are aware that the Council's Audit and Risk Assurance Committee procedures are also an issue for concern. The Registrar and a member of, of ARIC misled the Council by presenting a paper suggesting a vote of no confidence in the Chair and Vice Chair of Council, when in fact the Committee members had not even discussed that scenario. GTCNI is, now, is not delivering its statutory functions yet continues to be funded by mandatory fees paid by registered teachers. 
Of the utmost concern is that GTCNA is unable to investigate serious teacher misconduct or to remove teachers from the GTCNA register. I have heard the Department and register, uh, Registrar assure the committee that this is nothing to be worried about, as an employer process will take care of this issue. I do not agree and cannot provide you with an assurance today that GTCNA is helping safeguard our children and young people. For example, if a teacher is registered with GTCNA, they can also be registered with the Northern Ireland Substitute Teachers Register, so can move from school to school. There would be little chance of an employer process taking place in these circumstances. GTCNA has a significant number of cases on its caseload, and this is growing because it cannot process these cases. Some of these cases were passed by the department to GTCNA before it had the power to regulate teachers in 2015. These red files, including newspaper cuttings, were being held by GTCNA unbeknown to those individuals and in breach of their GDPR rights. Minister Weir and his officials have been aware of my concerns since February 2020. Officials have not helped the situation through your actions, including interfering in the employer processes, refusing to permit me to answer questions to the Northern Ireland Children uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People and to op in an open and transparent manner, and misleading me to believe that DE had not endorsed the registrar's response, response to NICCY which avoided answering the specific questions and refusing to permit a council-led investigation into the breaches of the Nolan Principles. In conclusion, the Council welcomes the, mem the Minister's review of the organisation. This is the third review of its type. Teacher members of the and members of the public and children require significant change to ensure that GTCNA, which is funded through public money, is the professional organisation it should be. The Chair and I are, willing to, are happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brandon. Obviously, more concerning evidence being received by the Education Committee. Um, you, you'll be aware if you followed our, our evidence sessions that the Education Committee has now heard that the GTCNI is dysfunctional, subject to whistleblowing, intentional disruption of business by council members, allegations of bullying and harassment. My understanding is now multiple resignations and perhaps most concerningly today that it is unable to guarantee that GTCNI is capable of safeguarding children and young people in Northern Ireland. Is that a, a fair understanding of what you've said? Well, I, I, I would stand over that. We cannot, nobody... No uh, professional can guarantee the safeguarding of children by the mechanisms in, in place in GTCNA, because we can't we cannot remove teachers from the, the register. Okay, well, you, you'll accept then that's a, a catalogue of, of risk and dysfunctionality. What what responsibility do you, as chair and vice chair, take for that situation? Well, to be honest, chair, uh, we have done. Um, you have seen a 56-page uh, paper that I presented. Uh, there will be far more papers than that that I presented on my behalf and the behalf of the Vice Chair. Uh, it would be improbable or impossible to, to publish them all and give them all to you because they ju it just wouldn't be time to read it. But we have made numerous, uh, 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 um, I'd say, numerous advances towards the, the Department about this, our concerns. They're on record. Uh, for many, many years that we've put these, these concerns on record. Um, we've been uh, at the front of trying to do something about it. Now, to be fair, it's not, there's nobody in GTCNA who is to blame for the non-regulation of teachers. That's not, not the fault of the chair or the vice chair or the registrar. It's none of their, their fault. That problem lies with the DA um, because, as you know, uh, in part of the papers, uh, the former Minister for Education made a statement to the Assembly Committee on in November 2014 in which he said there is a grave problem facing education. And this is the problem, uh, Chair. Nothing has been done about that since that time. I mean, this is we're now in 2021. That was 2014. What has happened? Why has the legislation not been changed? I was going to ask you that question. Obviously, this education committee was constituted and established in 
January 2020 and GTC has been on our agenda throughout our time in office. We've now heard from GTC, the Department of Education and GTC again. Why do you think the Department of Education has not enacted legislation to remedy the deficient regulatory framework of the GTC? Well, to be honest, Chair, I can't answer for anybody else. I can only answer for myself or uh, on behalf of Council, but I have no answers as to why the, the Department have not remedied this issue. But uh, I'm assured by people, in the, on the, even on the staff, that this has been on the radar since 2014 and nothing has been done about it. You have no understanding or, or any communication of any kind as to what is preventing the Department of Education from enacting that legislation? Well, we were told that there was a hold up of the Department Solicitor's Office, that they were busy processing other uh, other um, legislation, in particular uh, SEN legislation and um, that's special educational needs legislation and then the COVID uh, crisis. But, I mean, the COVID crisis started in 2019. The the uh, minister's letter was made in 2014. Okay, and why why do you think the GTC is in special measures? Well, um, it's in special measures. Uh, we are told um, because of the the whistleblown complaints, uh, 112. And uh, on my being elected as chair, my first meeting with the permanent secretary at the time, it's not the current permanent secretary. Um, I stated that a basis for moving forward would be for the department to come into GTC and I and explain, uh, produce the whistleblowing report, explain where things are going wrong, and use that as a baseline for moving forward. But that has been rejected, and the the uh, whistleblowing report has been per, has been effectively buried. And so all those 112 whistleblowing complaints uh, are now in disparate locations. Nobody knows where what the, there's no. A holistic approach for the GTCNA in order to um, to improve itself. I'll give you a, a scenario. Imagine, as chair, you were back in your school days and you were doing an exam, and the the, the uh, your teacher came back and said you got forty six out of a hundred, and you said, well, can you tell me where I went wrong? And you said, and the teacher told you no. How do you improve on that, uh, chair? Hmm. Okay. Well. I mean, what what has what has your role as as chair and vice chair been in responding to those issues? Well, um, as I outlined in my paper, myself and the vice chair have asked on numerous occasions, could we speak to the uh, our legal uh, people or the the department solicitor's office, and we're blocked. Um, the registrar's blocked us from speaking to the the uh, chair, so we don't as. as I'm effectively a lame duck chair. I cannot okay. speak. I'm not been allowed to, and neither is my okay. deputy chair. So we're not okay. allowed to speak for legal people about the changes in the legislation. There's there's a number of things I've outlined in the papers that the faults in the in the legislation would need to need to urgently addressed. Okay. Two not- two uh, two final questions from me. Um, the education committee has heard that mem- council members have orchestrated disruption of council business. Is that something that you have witnessed? Um, well, it, it depend, I don't know. I mean, I have seen people uh, filibuster um, uh, to talk out to... I mean, we held a special meeting in which we... Um, to try and iron out uh, divisions on the council... And members talked it out so that it wasn't. I wasn't allowed to address and explain to members all the under underlying uh, faults in the organisation. So, yeah, okay. I've, I've have seen things, but I haven't seen. I certainly haven't seen bullying going on in the council. That certainly would be uh, okay. in the council itself. I have okay. as I said, produced a documentation to show that there's allegations of bullying among the staff. But okay, um, members, mem- other members might want to pick that up. Finally. Um, We've we've taken evidence to suggest that GTC should be uh, should be ceased and that a new, more fit for purpose professional body for teachers should be established. Do do you agree? And if so, in what way would you reform GTC? Well, on, on the current grounds, it is not it's not moving forward. 
and there's to, to spell it out, and it's very harsh. We've been told that in, in for regulation to take place would be a minimum of two years before leg, legislation could be changed. So for another two years, the, the organisations going along with no regulation taking place, the same problems that we have now, and um, that's not going to be remedied in, in two years. So the whole legislation would need to be looked at and taken back, purred back to the, the, the basis of where we, we, we are regulating and registering teachers and, and our main four main uh, areas uh, of statutory responsibility. Should, um, should, uh, should, uh, should GTC be abolished? In the current state that it's in, it, I, I don't think there's any future in, in the in the this the system that it's going forward at the minute. I, okay. I do think there there's a need for a professional body. Absolutely. I, I, I do believe that uh, the current body is far too large. Uh, I do believe that ordinary classroom teachers are not fairly represented on the current body, and I do believe they have been sidelined for far too long. Absolutely. Our, our teachers and our, our children, our pupils in Northern Ireland need and deserve uh, a, a professional body of, of which they can be proud and on which they can rely. Th thanks for those uh, answers, Brendan. Can I bring in Pat Sheehan, MLA, Deputy Chairperson? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks to Brenton and Siobhan. Uh, there are a wide range of issues which point to the dysfunctionality of the GTC, and you've listed a number of them here in the briefing. But what I'm concerned about most is the potential risk that exists to our, our children and young people uh, due to these issues. And it would appear that the onset of Brexit compounds this risk by removing local access to the EU safeguarding database, uh, the tool that uh, is used to do background checks on, on prospective applicants qualified to teach within the EU. So uh, I suppose the first question is, is, is it the case then that Brexit is actually exposing our children to potential risk? Um, currently, the, the effect has not taken place yet because there is a time lag of nine months, I believe, when uh, the UK pulled out of EU uh, and Brexit was actually officially sanctioned. Um, we were allowed, uh, the professional body, GTC and I, were allowed access by the EU for a further nine months. So as of, I believe, September 2021, we will no longer have access to that database which screens te professional teachers across the EU. Uh, what that will mean for us will be uh, there's relatively small numbers of teachers who come in from the main, uh, main uh, European uh, locations, but we do have a, a number that would come from the Republic, uh, mostly to Irish language medium schools because of their, uh, their capability in, in speaking Irish. So uh, those people now will have to be will have to be treated as rest of the world applicants. Now, what that means is, rest of the world applicants do not have the same mechanisms for uh, screening uh, and vetting. Okay, so they go through a, a, compl a more complicated process, a more costly process for GTCNA, and we do not have the, the the ability to ensure that somebody has to. And this is where legislation needs to change. Somebody has to produce a, a, a suitability to teach um, affidavit or you know uh, some sort of paper that that would that could be stood over that we could guarantee they don't have to produce that. That's a, a weakness in the legislation. So it's what a, rather than making it a weakness for or a, a threat to the, the pupils in our education system, what it'll do is it'll possibly keep teachers out who want to come up, say for instance, into the Irish medium sector. It will give them a, an elongated process, maybe a delay in getting in, or certainly in the future, it will be envisaged by certainly an elevated cost to coming in for teachers from the Irish Republic. Yeah, and it has been suggested that the cost may be 10 times what it currently is. And tell me, Brenton, who picks up the tab for that? Currently, every teacher who comes into GTCNA is is. Uh, is is paid. They pay a registration fee of forty-four pounds, and that's what a teacher from the Irish Republic would pay at the minute. But in future, 
if that elongated process and the GTCNI has agreed in principle that it would be unfair that somebody coming in from Belarus or somewhere else and the cost to the organisation is £500, that that should be borne by every other teacher. So uh, they have agreed in principle that the cost would ref be reflected in the charge to the teacher. So in future, that elevated cost will be paid by the applicant. So the teacher coming in from the Irish Republic would pay whatever, £500 or £600 or whatever, instead of the £44 paid by ordinary registrants from Northern Ireland. Yeah. And you've, you've already said that the Irish medium sector will be disproportionately affected by this, uh, particularly because I suppose they recruit a significant number of teachers from Gaeltag areas, native speaking, uh, native Irish speaking teachers. Um, so tell, tell me what the impact that is going to have on the Irish medium sector. Well, to be honest, I can't uh, say for certain, but I imagine it will lead to difficulties for the Irish medium sector in recruiting. Um, uh, my understanding is the Irish medium sector is the fastest growing sector in uh, itself and the integrated sector, the fastest growing sectors in, in the north. So uh, I imagine it will have a knock-on effect. I can't say for certain. I can't quantify that effect, but I imagine it's not going to be a positive effect. Yeah. Yeah, and given that there's already a shortage of teachers in the Irish medium sector, uh, this particular issue is only going to exacerbate things, I would say. So anyway, thanks for that. Uh, thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Thanks. Robin, I think you may need to unmute the device. Thank you. That, uh, that's, you, that's, that's you now, Robin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to Brendan and Siobhan uh, for this morning. And I, I, I think all of us realized that, well, realized that this was a very difficult situation. Uh, I think we're beginning to realize it's a much more serious situation than, than perhaps we had thought uh, as we uh, started to take the evidence and. Brendan's remarks about the guarantee, the safeguarding of children, I think will be of real concern for all of us uh, and indeed for every parent that has children at school uh, at the moment. Uh, and I thank you for that, uh, Brendan, for being so open uh, uh, on this matter. I think I suppose, Brandon, in terms of the, the fact that we were three years of the Assembly's life in this mandate, we weren't operational, probably hasn't helped uh, the situation. Uh, but can I just ask you, in terms of, uh, you'd refer to faults in the legislation, if you could just maybe be a wee bit more specific in that. And then, uh, Chair, I think, had ask the question about if it was abolished. It doesn't really seem to me that if it was abolished, it would be nearly any worse off because something would have to be put in place until a new body was uh, uh, brought into to being. And in terms of the organization being in special measures, I mean, my little experience of special measures in schools is that there then is always a route uh, planned out of the special measures and uh, support put in to bring the, the organization school if it's special measures back to uh, functioning uh, professionally. So is there, uh, in your case, special measures route uh, being developed? Uh, yes, the department has uh, provided uh, a guideline. I mean, I've asked for a roadmap out of special measures, but to be honest, uh, Robin, it's not going to. The, the answer that we got back was so huge that it would take the GTC and I many years to get out of it. Uh, number one, um, uh, for our, for sorry, the sake of clarity, one of the things that we have not passed, we've been tur turned down, uh, we've got received limited insurance, is because we cannot regulate, and GTC and I have no power. To change that situation, we cannot change it. So it's outside our field to be able to actually work our way out of special measures. If that's one of the, the basis on which we get out, is to regulate. We can't do that. 
we require the department to step in and change the legislation in order to allow us to, to fulfil our statutory function. Um, so, I mean, there's some of this is not the fault of people within the GTC and I. It's not the fault of the staff, not for, from the registrar down. It's not their fault that they cannot regulate. It's That's outside our, our, our uh, in sphere of influence. We cannot change that. Okay, and, and, and in terms of... Um... If, if the organisation was abolished today, presumably the department would have to put something in place to allow the rules. I mean, uh, and would that be any worse than what's happening at the minute, Brendan? Uh, there's an important part that we have to, uh, dis well, we have to designate as separate. The registration, we can vet people coming into the or into the teaching workforce but we cannot get them out we cannot remove them okay the only mechanism currently available to remove teachers from the registration database is if there's a referral from the disclosure and borrowing service as you know you were told by the registrar that there were four teachers who were removed but that's not any mechanism with the gtc and i that that, that was responsible for that that was simply uh a routine me mechanism where we receive a referral that these people are not fit to be in, uh, you know, given access to children. Therefore, they cannot be a teacher. So it's it's basically a form filling. But we cannot uh, we cannot uh, regulate somebody who's been referred to us. <laughs> Sorry about that. Apologies for that. Um, so we cannot regulate. Um, people who are in the profile, we can't put them out, but we can still stop people getting in who there would be queries about. Um, you know, so there's there's some vetting that can take place at the point of like at the point of entry. But once they're in, they can't be put out, if that if you understand. So um it do, it is doing a useful job in that respect. And they have has always done that useful job. So I mean unless if it was going to be abolished the the Department of Education would have to step in to take on the registration of teachers, uh, allowing them into the profession, recognising their qualifications, uh, accrediting qualifications from universities here, etc. Um, but we're not doing the, the, the regulating. That's the part that we're not doing. Okay. That's um, almost six minutes, Robin, just to give you a wee warning. Thanks. Just very quickly, Chair, then. Brendan, what would be your recommendations then? Uh, Robin, uh, my recommendation would be an urgent, an urgent look at the regulations or the, the legislation. Um, uh, an emergency team sit down and look at the legislation. I cannot see how the legislation cannot be changed fairly swiftly. The, the faults in it are fairly straightforward. We have had a, a leading barrister who looked at the faults in it. They've pointed them out. We know what the faults are. Um, I know the legislation process requires consultation, etc., but the ball stood, should be started to roll in order that we are uh, we are able to regulate. I mean, the um, teacher body in, in Wales regulates successfully, but they, they looked at the legislation at the start and they had to change their legislation. It just hasn't happened here for whatever reason. I know you say that we the assembly was closed for three years and I accept that, but this, this was 2014. There really isn't an excuse now that we haven't, it isn't a high priority issue to get this resolved. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Brandon and uh, Siobhan for being with us and sharing uh, information, answering and taking our uh, questions. Um, <laughs> What an utter shambles this is, um, hugely embarrassing and worrying. Um, and uh, I've, I've taken careful consideration and note of a lot of the points that have been shared so far. And whilst there are serious issues with regulation, that doesn't point to the really serious issues internally within the GTC, because the internal fights within the GTC or the accusations of bullying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, have nothing to do with regulation. It's a complete dysfunction of the organization and the body generally. Just before I've, I, I, I ask a question, I've heard a lot, Brandon, from yourself in relation to 
the many challenges and issues that exist within the GTC. But you're chair of the GTC and Siobhan is vice chair. So I, I'd like to know from your perspective, given your concern, how you would fix the structures, how you would fix the governance arrangements and the relationship between the GTC and the department. Okay, well, uh, as I said there, uh, when I was talking to the chair, um, on my first meeting with the permanent secretary, I sat down, I, I said um, that there's a whistleblowing report with 112 whistleblowing complaints in it. Uh, they're all made by people within the GTC and I, I'm assuming inside the organisation. That could be that some of them have come from outside, but I'm assuming that they're from within the organisation. If you're told that there are faults, and we were told, I was told at the time, that these were grave, grave serious issues. The only way to address those is to make them open, is to look at where you've gone wrong, what, what mistakes you've made, and then to put them right. So, for instance, if the organisation is doing something wrong, if they're approaching uh, something in the wrong way, you sit down and you say, look, folks, that can't happen. You've made a mistake here. When you're doing this in future, you do it by this. But by burying the whistleblowing report, or at least not letting us see it, we can't remedy those mistakes. So the mistakes, it's uh, like the, I can't remember the name of the guy who pushes the rock up the, the mountain and it comes down again. Um, we are complete, We're continuing to make the same mistakes over and over again because we're not told what the mistakes are. Um, I mean, myself and Siobhan are both classroom teachers. And one of the tenets of being a teacher is to explain to pupils and that the... the, the um, you know, it's common to, to human nature. You have to explain where you've gone wrong in order to make the, that, that right or make sure you don't repeat that mistake in the future. So my, my suggestion, and Siobhan agreed with me at this time, would have been that the whistleblowing report was made public. It doesn't have to be. It could have been anonymized so that we take the individuals out of it. We're not looking. Nobody's looking to blame an individual or hang on all the faults of one individual. But you look at where the mistakes are made and then you work forward from there. You say, look, we can't do it this way. We're doing it wrong. When we did it that way, this X, Y, and Z happened. So uh, that would be my way of looking forward. You put the, and it would, it would have taken an intervention. It would have taken the department to come in and say, look, um, this is the whistleblowing report. We've, we've got 112 report, uh, complaints here. Let's look at the most serious 40 of them and look where we went wrong. So make sure that we're not doing that again. I'm sure some of them were... Uh, you know, the same complaint about the same issue. So um, it probably boiled down to a lot less than that. But that's the way, the basis of moving forward. You have to look at where you made mistakes and then look moving forward from there. Okay, just just um, on that, and then the, there's a number of points here. Mark Brown, the Permanent Secretary, for instance, did, did he not tell you uh, that you already had been told all the information you needed to know to take the situation forward as chair of the GTC? Is that is that correct? Oh, that might well be the case, but that would be his opinion. We have never been. I'll tell you how, how, how what it is. You might find this, this uh, confusing. We are not even allowed to see the terms of reference of the whistleblowing. That's how secret it is. Now, we were told you couldn't see it. Now, I was told it right at the outset that there would be no problem anonymizing this report. As I say, we're not looking for somebody's head on a pike. We're looking to, to move forward, uh, work together to, to remedy the mistakes. We were told that all of this could be uh, anonymised so that you you you, uh, you can move, move forward without naming someone. And then suddenly we were told, no, you can't have it. The whistleblower report's not going anywhere. It's in a cupboard somewhere at the Department of Education and nobody's allowed to see it. OK, just another point. Claiming that it will cost 10 times the register in the Republic of Ireland in response to Pat Sheehan. You know, is it not within the council's powers to permit people coming from within the common travel area to pay the standard fee? That's the gift within the GTC to set those fees. So is the it point is, you've made, Mr. Sheehan, not scaremongering from the GTC? Uh, sorry, are you saying I'm scaremongering? That I asked, is that not the GTC scaremongering? The response you give to Mr. Sheehan, the fees, the fees are set to the GTC. Yeah. So why would we set it 10 times higher than what they should be? Because... Uh, people, applicants from the Republic of Ireland or from Europe will be treated exactly the same as somebody coming from Spain or anywhere else in the world. Uh, yes. It could be 
Latin America. That, that, that's, that's at your discretion. That's at the discretion of the GTC. That, that doesn't have to be the case. This can be set by the GTC, given that we have an all-island uh, economy and we have a system, a free flow uh, uh, system here across this island in terms of people that come across the border to teach both ways. You know, th- those fees are set by the GTC and it's at the discretion of the GTC. So I would say to you, uh, and I don't want to respond to this, this isn't even a problem that that could be resolved very quickly with GTC by setting the fees, and that's a disgrace GTC. I don't want to get hung up on that. I just want to set that point out. Just in, in relation to um, another point that has been raised in relation to vetting, you know, what, what, what you, you, you've, you've expressed a lot of concern in relation to vetting, but what's the council doing to address it? Well, actually, um, the council did take legal advice. Now, not myself and Siobhan have made this point many times to the permanent secretary that we thought that when, when you're having staff who are dealing with people coming into a profession where they have access to, ki- to children, that all those staff needed to be vetted. The staff who are vetting the people coming in, them themselves need to be vetted. Um, so they have taken legal advice. that we, we insisted on it. We were told it wasn't important. And now the legal advice has come back and said, yes, that would be a good idea. So they have, they have taken that forward. But as I say, we weren't allowed to speak to the solicitors. They took our uh, our suggestion, said it was a good idea, and then did it. But we weren't obviously allowed to speak. And oh. sorry, just to come back, just to come back on your other point there uh, about uh, letting people from the Republic of Ireland. It's not as simple as that. The GTC and I can't just pick a country at will and say, "Look, we're, we're going to charge you favourable fees," because that they're part of Europe. Um, and the, the second point of it, you need to, uh, to do that. In order to do that, you have to set up a reciprocal arrangement with the, the Teaching Council of Ireland. So the two bodies could come together and they could uh, set, uh, set aside the arrangements that they have for uh, fees for those two jurisdictions. But it's not as simple as just saying, uh, yes, uh, applicants from the Republic of Ireland PLS. It can't happen that way. There's a, there's a huge arrangement that will have to go through. And... They're, the vetting arrangements, we do not have access. We still would not have access to the uh, the European vetting uh, mechanism. Brian, I, don't, I really don't want to get hung up on the fees issue, but I'm going to say firmly it is within the discretion and the gift of the GTC to sort that out, particularly within the common travel area. There should be no disparity in relation to fees across this island, north or south. And again, I will reiterate, that is within the gift of the GTC. Can I ask you, Brian, uh, is there, uh, are, are, you, are you, as chair... You know, you could resolve this problem very quickly. So, therefore, is the GTC creating a border on this island? If we're talking about Brexit <laughs> and we're talking about the implications of Brexit, is the GTC creating an issue here in terms of these fees? No, GTC is not creating the issue. The issue was created by Brexit. The uh, minute Brexit came into place, we were removed, GTC and I was removed from having access to the uh, IMA, which is the vetting, uh, vet- vetting database in Europe. We do not have access to that. So we cannot check somebody coming up from Ruff, Ruff, Ruff wherever, uh, anywhere, Dublin, uh, Rathfarnham, anywhere. We cannot check them. Just, just a, on a separate point, and I want to chair uh, briefly go back to the dysfunction of this organisation generally, yeah. because almost, really, almost out of time, Daniel. Go yeah, ahead. That's where the attention of of, of uh, many of us are uh, focused. You know. It, I firmly believe, uh, after hearing what I've heard today, that this organisation may be beyond repair. Is that your view as chair of this organisation? Well, as I said earlier, I, 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 it, needs, it needs major reform uh, and it would need an intervention and it needs the whistleblowing report looked at. It probably needs uh, legislation uh, taken from top to bottom. It, it's been recommended from a long time that the council is far too large. Uh, so yes, I believe in the in the it will need uh, root and branch uh, change in order to move forward. But some of that is outside its its control uh, in in relation to regulation, etc. And is it the case? Okay. That, and we've had the final uh, comment, Daniel. Thanks, Chairs. On many occasions, the people that have stood for various positions of election in the GTC have stood so quite publicly and proudly to dismantle this organisation, or in some instances, bring it down or to ensure that it doesn't function. Would you say that's an accurate reflection of what happens? I have not, I've never come across anybody, including appointed members or elected members, who have actually made life difficult inside the organisation. They've all functioned, they've all done their, their duty. Once they've got into the, the post, they've done their duty, they've worked as hard as they can, 
And many of these people are working at night. They're doing their full their full time job in school, and they've come home, or uh, if they're not teachers, that they've made themselves available uh, during work hours to carry out the work of GTSN. I have not seen anybody who's gone out of their way to deliberately uh, hinder the work of the GTCNA. Okay. Thanks, very, Daniel. Very brief, Chair, just a comment. Uh, Bren, I do appreciate your answers and your time. Given that you, you feel so strongly that this organisation is so dysfunctional and not to misquote you in any way, possibly beyond repair, um, given an answer to a previous member, wh why do you remain in position as Chair of this organisation? Well, Daniel, do you think I would be able to tell you today uh, if I was not sure? Well, I'm sure there'd be another. <laughs> but I'm just, well, you know, my question I'm is glad, if you the organization isn't functioning. You are sure. I'm okay. glad you are sure of that. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, can, I, can I ask very briefly, uh, Brendan, um, is it possible to say how many times GTC and I would have removed teachers from the register if you had the power to do so? Or, or does, it, uh, does it not get to that stage because you don't have the power? Well, we don't have the power. Um, but uh, there's there's a safety mechanism built into the GTCNA that council members themselves do not see. So I've never seen anybody's case. I don't know what they are. They are. Siobhan, likewise, will not have seen anybody's case. Uh, we don't see the severity of the case. We don't see, you know, if things are flagged up as a red flag. We don't. We, members of council don't see that. Who does um, see it? So, well, it would uh, in the past it would have been uh, regulatory officers in the council would have looked at it, and uh, they will know. But they they wouldn't. They, that information has never crossed the boundary between paid staff to for a good reason, because um, it wouldn't be fair if we at some point were asked to uh, you know judi adjudicate on a, a situation okay. where we have already been you know pre ordered. Okay. Or, or, or. okay. Uh, Robbie Butler, MLA. Robbie, we, we're struggling to hear you. Are you on mute by any chance? No. Yeah, Avian's nodding yeah. her head, so Avian's, Avian's correct. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Brent and Siobhan, for coming on to spend some time with us. It's not easy to come to these sessions, I'm sure, given the extent of the reports. Um, as you've said, Brent, there's 112, well, there was 112 whistleblowing allegations, I think, in 2019, at the time that you took over. Um, and there's extensive um, documentation and stuff, which we have looked at. And um, I've listened to some of the members and they talk about uh, the registration fees. I think you guys take in about £1.2 million pounds per year and it's like a flatline budget and you guys sort of have to, have to obviously work within that remit. However, given the scale uh, of problems that have existed for many years, Brenton and Siobhan, before, your, before you guys uh, took, took the chairs and the vice chair, um, the, the scale and burden, uh, which is very heavy on departmental staff, uh, uh, and, and all of those other bodies, those, those statutory bodies must be immense. I'm thinking of the like of Alison Chambers, who is the head of the sponsor team, for instance, and her team, who obviously have responsibility for many other things, not, not just GTC and I. Um, have you any quantification of that cost, the additional cost that the dysfunctionality of GTC and I has cost the um, taxpayer at all? Has there ever been any uh, look at that, Bryn? No, we've never, that's never been quantified for us. But I imagine... Um, it would be sizable uh, because the department have, we've been told on numerous occasions, have put uh, in many, many hours of work and they have set aside resources just specifically for GTCNA. I mean, the, the, the principle of GTCNA is, is fine and I think there's there's a need to have a professional organisation like, like we have, but it's urgent that that whatever costs you're, you're referring to, that they are reduced by... They, you know, and, and it may be that it may in the long term be reduced, and it may actually be that they need to increase in order to put resources in to make sure that GTCNI is functional. Okay, I'm just, I'm just I'm just going to bounce in because I've well, only got six minutes, and I want to get as many sort of questions as possible, if that's okay. Um, uh, I think I just want to say thanks to all those people like like of Alison Chambers who have actually been um, extending themselves to try and sort things out. Um, can I, I'm interested in this, uh, Brendan, you'd said about um, the inability for you guys to see the uh, and see disclosures and stuff to, to make improvements and stuff. But I'm interested to see in terms of you as chair and Siobhan as vice chair, um, in your tenure, has there ever been uh, unanimity of council since uh, you, you took up post? Yeah. 
Um, uh, the unanimity of, of council in, in that everybody on council wants to see the organisation regulate teachers. And there's, there's, but uni- um, unanimity, unanimity would be singular purpose. So it's like, does everybody want to improve? Everybody's hand goes up. How do you want to improve? We want to improve this way. We want to improve this way. What I'm talking about is unanimity and then the, the delegated authority or um, the authority you have as chair. Is that, do you act in, in your provision as chair with authority from council or can you act as chair without the authority of council? Uh, I, I imagine it's like the chair of any and the vice chair of any board. There are times where you have to make decisions where you cannot call a full council meeting. Um, you know, uh, it takes, I mean, it's like your, it's like government where you have the, the, the parliament will make decisions, but there'll be times when a parliament can't meet where, you know, during the holidays or over a weekend where some serious issue comes up that the, the, the prime minister will have to make a decision. And that's, you know, are, they, are, are, are those powers specified, Britain? Are they implied? They're they're implied. I mean, there, there are some powers that are specified, but I mean, it's you. The ideal is that you do everything. That you try and make sure that the the, um, the the council has has backed every decision you could do, you can you make. But there will be occasions where there there be you will cross new territory where. <laughs> You will have to make snap decisions, and that will be your role as the chair or the vice okay, chair. Okay, so, so those would those would be implied functions, which wouldn't carry the same weight. Um, so, in terms of the council making a decision and you getting that authority, is it by consensus or is it by majority? Well, it will depend. I mean, there were a number of of, uh, of cases where, well, the council v- votes unanimously to, to back an issue, or it will be that, uh, as you say, the council and on some issues. Uh, will be very polarised. I'm sure it's like the assembly itself, and you will have one group who want to do one thing and one group who will not want to do it, and therefore you are, you have an issue. Um, okay. I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that it is a teacher's council. Yeah, I, I, yes. You really, can, can I come in on that point? I think that's really important because it's good that you guys are teachers, actually by trade, So and, and you took up post-2019-2020, but did you have any role with GTC and I prior to 20, taking up role as chair and vice chair? We, we were both ordinary members of council before that in the previous council. And at that stage, did you guys raise any concerns and issues yourselves? Um, I'm not asking you to declare any sort of whistleblowing things in terms of that, but did you guys have raised concerns yourselves with regard, obviously these things go back 2014 or possibly even before? Absolutely. I mean, well, we weren't there in 2014, but mm-hmm. we were there in, I was, myself and Siobhan would have been there from 2016. Um, and the whistleblower, all those whistleblowing reports didn't happen in this council. Yeah. They're not in council whistleblowing reports. They're from the previous council that have never been resolved. So yes. what, what happened is you had all these issues that were flagged up and many of them, I'm sure, were said, yes, those, those are, those are uh, valid but we're not not been told. So the new council start again, haven't been told the mistakes of the previous council in order to remedy them. Yeah, I, I get I get that. There's, there's that. Did you, Siobhan, do you want to come in briefly? Because I've got two more questions and I want to make sure you get them, get them in. Yep. I was going to say, Robbie, you've just highlighted the fact we were previous council members. There were issues um, GTC and I had went into special measures. It came out very quickly. And maybe one of the issues that came out too quickly and without the proper oversight. Um, we didn't want to walk away. We've seen our issues. As a teacher of over 25 years, it was important to us to make sure the professional body representing teachers was fit for purpose. And that if we hadn't stood down, and when people stand down, if you walk away, and I'm sure like you all, many of the time, you feel like walking away, but mm. what happens? It will fall apart. And I couldn't walk away and I got re-elected. Now there are 14 of us who got stood for election. And we have been, and I have to say, the chair has put a shoulder to the wheel at every opportunity to try and unify the council. Communications flow to everybody. And people are asked, the Nolan principles guide Brent and myself at all times. Okay, th- thank you for that, Siobhan. And very quickly, Chair, if that's okay. Um, the, the, yep, the that's real, one, Robbie. Thanks, Chair. The, the real priority here, guys, for me, and this has already been outlined, is the risk to safeguarding of children. Because I can think of no other uh, more... The most important purpose that GTC and I will fulfil is is to um, provide that oversight for the, the safeguarding of our children. Can you quantify the risk for us today, please, as to uh, what that is with regard to is there is there 
uh, an absolute risk to the safeguarding of our children due to the inability uh, for you guys to regulate uh, teachers in Northern Ireland? Well, would you like me to come in on that? Um, yes, yes, please. Can I explain uh, how regulation would normally happen? Maybe that would be good for the whole, the whole committee. Um, regulation would be, say for instance, somebody if somebody goes through the court system and they have done something which would affect children, well, that will go through the, the Disclosure and Borrowing Service and that will come back to, to GTCNA and they will be automatically removed. What the regulation per, uh, system is different, the mechanism is different. The, reg, reg, the regulation system works on a different threshold of evidence. Okay, So you wouldn't necessarily need to be convicted in a court of law in order to have your, your registration removed. Okay, um, So for argument's sake... Uh, I don't want to get into any politics, but most people in, in the North will, will appreciate the Oma bomb thing, right? Um, where it, there was no criminal charge because the, the DPP didn't think there was enough evidence to, to prosecute. But it went to a civil case and uh, the, the people who took the case uh, won their case because it was a lower, a lower threshold of evidence. And the same thing would apply in GTCNA, or theoretically would apply, apply in GTCNA. So that lower bar of evidence wouldn't it would be on the balance of probabilities rather than the criminal uh, the criminal threshold, which is beyond all reasonable doubt. And that's the difference. Okay, those two things are very important. To to summarise it for you, somebody in Wales, or Scotland, or England, or the Republic of Ireland could be removed from their profession. But in our jurisdiction, that would not happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Robbie, do you want to come in with a yep. final question uh, before we th move on here? Th th thank you so much, Brent. I don't know if you listened to uh, plenary this week, but we had a very important motion on uh, restraint and seclusion. And, and that's obviously very much with regard to safeguarding, and it was a successful motion. Um, if you're aware of it, then I'm, I'm thinking in terms of you've talked about the legal recourse, and that's really important in, in, this, uh, in this context then. So with regard, so the minister, I think, is going to make a commitment to do something about that. He's ready to give guidance. But is it, is it your uh, position that, for instance, at the moment, that if a parent had issues, that GTCA and I would have no recourse and no point, part to play in, for instance, a parental uh, allegation or complaint that, that there had been uh, an incidence of uh, inappropriate uh, restraint or seclusion? Well, no, the, the, what would happen was that would go to GTCA and, I, and it would be uh, failed because we, we can't do anything, it would be, uh, we can't remove the teacher, there can't be a hearing, there can't be anything that will happen. Now, if that goes through a criminal procedure, uh, then that would go through the courts, and that would end up with the, the disclosure and borrowing service. And if they found that, if the, the say for instance, the court case was successful, then that would be the mechanism. But GTC and I would not pre play any role in it, other than having the referral. They and that, and, and that, that is a major deficiency. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for those questions, Robbie. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thank you very much. Um, good morning, Brenton and Siobhan. Thank you very much for your evidence this morning. Brenton, good morning. a number of people, including yourself, mentioned 2014. When did the issues that we're currently talking about start, in your opinion? Well, can, do you mind if I pull out the, the minister's thing, um, declaration of that? Well, in your opinion, I don't want to mention it. In your opinion. In my, in my opinion, well, there's, there's, um, there's reports and reviews that have happened that have occurred before we actually joined the organisation. Um, and I think I've included a sort of snapshot inside the, the, uh, inside the uh, pack that I sent up uh, that said that illustrated exactly the same sort of issues that we're talking about now. So it, it, the issues would have started before we ever come up, you know, we're members of GTCNA. Uh, the yeah, council, so what year, what year are we talking about then, in your opinion? Well, to be honest with you, I, I couldn't go beyond about 2014. That, that's as far as I know. It, I mean, could why, have been. Why, why do you think um, Mr Gallagher um, wanted to give his evidence alone and what, why are you giving your evidences uh, uh, without him being present? Well, I, I think... I, well, I, do, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the communications I've put in. I'm a whistleblower, so I, I've put them hand up and said I've, I've been come forward as a whistleblower and I've said you know issues that I felt were important uh, that mm -hmm. needed dealt with so uh, I think it was it was fair that I mean, and 
it's fine that uh, the registrar wanted to give his evidence alone. That's perfectly fine. That's, uh, myself and Siobhan would, we would like to give evidence or, uh, the same way, to give him the same well, way. I, I understand that you're a whistleblower. I understand that completely. But you have to understand how, when we look at this, this looks like a completely dysfunctional uh, organisation. And an organisation has been dysfunctional for some time. I mean, thank you, Gavin, during your evidence, you said placing special measures on two occasions. Like, yep. Why why place in special measures? Well, I, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not fully of faith, nor will anybody be fully of faith with why the organisation was put in special measures in the first case. Uh, because when we joined, uh, myself and Siobhan joined GTC and I, they were dealing with the, the um, well, the after effects of the special measures that were put in. So we were put in while the organisation was still in special measures. Um, we weren't told about the special measures because there were court cases pending, etc. And we were told we, we didn't need to know. So uh, all those mistakes, whatever they went before we joined, were still prevalent in the organisation. And they've never addressed them. We were told, well, look, there are legal cases going on. And, you know, part of the, there'll be non-disclosure agreements, etc., etc. So that was used as a mechanism of not telling, not, not telling you. So it, I'm sorry to say this, but you were almost born to fail. Uh, yeah. If you weren't, you know, if you weren't yeah. told what the problems were before you joined, I, mean, I listened carefully to your evidence, and you said, and I quote here: "GTC not delivering uh, statutory functions." Um, so uh, we're really talking about an organisation here that you're chairman of that is not fit for purpose, aren't we? Really? Well, it's not delivering all its its um, its regulatory statutory functions. Um, it is delivering on three of them. Um, and it continues to do that that job. I mean, if it, if it was gone tomorrow, there would have to be something in its place because there has to be a mechanism of registering teachers. There would have to be a mechanism of accrediting courses. There would have to be a mechanism of feeding back from the profession to the, uh, the permanent secretary. Those things would still have to happen. So the DA would probably have to take over those if this organisation was dissolved but, immediately. But is, but is the organisation... I, I, mean, I, I wrote down what you said, not delivering statutory functions... You're now saying that they're delivering some of them. I mean, are we talking about an organisation that's fit for purpose or are we not? Well, that's for others to decide. That will not be for me. My job is to uh, to chair the organisation as best I can. Um, yes, but if you're, if you're saying to this committee in evidence today that it's not able to carry out all of its functions, delivery of its statutory functions, surely you have an opinion on that as chairman? Well, to be honest with you, that's not my opinion, that it's not carrying out. That's a fact. Um, I mean, the internal auditors reported we're not carrying out our, our statutory functions. Yeah, no, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not deliberately misquoting you. I know, that, I know that's a fact, but what I'm asking you is, is it your opinion that, that the organisation is fit for a purpose and has a future? There is a future for the GTCNA, but I don't think the GTC in its current format uh, is going to be that future. That future is going to have to change. Okay. It's going to have to. I mean, the legislation itself is not fit for purpose. The legislation would set down GTC is not fit for purpose. It needs to be re, re, rehauled from top to bottom. Okay. I mean, you, and you talked about root and branch change. I mean, um, can I ask you uh, to be candid with us? Do you believe that the relationships that are clearly fractured here and that you're a whistleblower, we hear evidence from the the registrar, chief executive, whatever term we want to use, yourself and the vice chair here giving evidence separately. Are these relationships repairable and can this organisation be put back on track? I imagine the first step, uh, William, would be if we were to make the, anonymise the whistleblowing report and sat down and use that as a base map from our you know, roadmap for moving forward. That has to be the case. I mean, you can't, if, if you turn around to somebody and say, I mean, in the country itself, if you turn around and say, so look, you have to forget about such and such, um, people will not forget. They, they want a, a resolution of, if, if they see it as an injustice or a mechanism that continues to function wrongly, they want to see that that's remedied. Um, and until that is, I mean, it's I, n nobody, well, I mean, the, the members the, across the, the uh, council, whether they be appointed or elected, they all wanted to see the whistleblowing report. They're disappointed that they're not able to see it because, 
like it, as we say, myself and Siobhan, our school teachers, it's part, it's part of the parcel that you tell somebody where they make mistakes in order to remedy those mistakes. And it just seems like a huge injustice. If somebody tells you, look, you can't see it, we're not allowing you to see it. We tell that to a teacher and, uh, you know, they just look at you with a blank face because, you know, you're, you can't improve unless you're shown, shown where the mistakes are. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, William. Nicola Brogan, MLA. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, Brenton and Siobhan, for coming along today. Um, I think it's fair to say um, it's at least a complicated uh, topic. So we do appreciate you coming in front of the committee um, and providing some sort of clarity. I would just like to touch upon what Path has already raised about teachers' um, ability to get registered with the GTC if they're not from the north. So the example that uh, Brenton, you gave was um, for teachers from the south coming to teach in the north. Um, and as you said, quite rightly said, a lot of them would be going into the Irish medium sector. So I think you said it would be about five or six hundred pound um, to become registered. I'm assuming that's an annual fee, if well, it's annual. Yeah. To be honest with you, Nicola, now that is that is uh, that's not decided yet. Um, yeah. That is more reflective, probably, of the cost of somebody coming in from from that jurisdiction now because of Brexit. Uh, somebody coming from the south will be treated as somebody coming from Venezuela yeah. or somewhere else, and that's uh, somebody coming from that that region, say Venezuela. There, there'd be a huge amount of checks that would have to take place from the qualifications, their equivalents, etc. And unfortunately, the same thing will have to be applied to. Well, it will be applied. Um, they, they will be. They will face the same mechanism in GTC. It's not my response. Not my. No, Brian, I, I understand that. But the question I want to ask is, do you agree or would you say that the fact that the GTC is so dysfunctional has played a part in letting this uh, carry on? Would, if the uh, council was more functional, had better kind of relationships that you actually could have, put up, could have put up a better fight in order to um, let teachers in the South get registered with the council more easily and with less cost? Well, to be honest with you, that still is a possibility because uh, GTC and I can uh, come to a mutual understanding with the, the Teaching Council of Ireland and they could uh, come to an arrangement where they offset the fee or whatever. There's a relatively small number. I think it's in around 20 teachers come from the south to the north every year. Uh, so it's a relatively small number. But the, if they, it would cost money, obviously, for them to put a mechanism because they'd have to put a some sort of clearing and vetting mechanism in, um, or else the 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 Irish teaching uh, the down south would have to vet the teachers for us using the European uh, database, and then guarantee that 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 vetting. That's the only way I can see. Now that I could be wrong in this, but uh, I think that would be how th that they could get around that issue. Yeah. Um, and it's important. I, I don't think it's beyond the possibilities that you know uh, GTC and I couldn't come to an arrangement with uh, Teacher Council Ireland to to put in place a mechanism. And it'd have to be it would have to be mutual. It'd have to be the same for teachers from the north going to the south. So there'd yeah. have to be a mutual understanding between the two organisations. But it will be costly. Well, listen, I understand that, um, but I think it's a worthy point to make because the Irish medium sector has um, so many issues facing it anyway. It's on the resource and all that there, so um, any additional pressures are, are not welcome, you know. Um, can I ask as well what um, kind of engagement you've had? I know that you and Siobhan are still teachers, but what other kind of engagement have you had with teachers? What do they think about the council? What do they see as being a benefit of being part of it? Is it just a mandatory thing where they have to be uh, registered um, to be able to teach? Or have they any other views? Do they know what's going on within the council? Uh, I'm going to let Siobhan answer this, if that's okay, Nicola. Sure. Uh, Nicola, sometimes there, um, people just see it as being a registration. Ideally, when Brenton and myself joined the council, we had high hopes. There used to be correspondence comes out to teachers about professional development opportunities. Um, the education uh, section within the council was actually producing great documentations and looking at even underachievement. Now, don't get me wrong, there are still some pieces of work progress on, but slower than we would like. The ordinary teacher 
is actually wondering sometimes where their £44 has been invested to. And some people have asked, I know um, one of the previous MLAs that suggested there, we are here because we don't want to see this fall apart. What would this organisation be like if Brandon and myself resigned or walked away? Um, we need children in schools to be protected. We need um, proper you know, procedures in place. And that's why we're still here. And that's why we're serving a second time. Now, it's not easy. It's very difficult. It's been a difficult journey, but we're hoping to make some progress. And hopefully with the Education Committee being investigating this and looking at this, hopefully we'll see improvements in the future, Nicola. Siobhan, I completely agree. Teachers and students deserve to have um, those safeguarding um, measures put in place for them. Um, and that leads me on to my final question then. Where do you see the council going from here? What do you want to see from it? Um, and how do you see it being repaired? Or is it reparable? I personally see it as being able to be repaired. It's a bit like I know the SEMD itself, it went from 108 to 90 members. We are actually one of the concerns with all and everybody I know during the registered evidence, he um, pointed out the same fact. We have a 33 council body. Now, registered at the minute, there's over 25,000 teachers. Now, there needs to be some sort of professional body there for those to make sure that all children are protected and also all teachers are protected too. Because we need to make sure that there's procedures in place, that there's professional development opportunities and there's guidance in place. So hopefully I do see that with the current review taking place, um, it will not be shelved and put aside the way the one in 2015 was. So hopefully we do see some changes. Two years time, hopefully we'll be sitting with yourselves and talking about the journey that we've all made. Yep, um, hopefully, Siobhan. All right, okay. thanks for that and thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how this can wait for two years when we're talking about potential risk to children and young people, but I, I, and I, 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 that's not to take away from your, your agreement on the, the need to address it, Siobhan, by the way, um, but I, I, this, this, feels, this feels extremely urgent. Um, okay, let me bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please. Thanks. Hi, Brendan. How's it going? Thanks, Chair. Um, Brendan, firstly, can I congratulate you for your work on uh, producing PPE early on in this pandemic? You, on a number of schools locally and across the north, uh, contributed massively to giving people and communities, and especially healthcare workers, comfort when there, there was a real sense of panic. So I want to applaud you for that and for that work. Um, and some areas and Yuri here. Um, as a son of two teachers, I'm, I'm disturbed, I'm upset, I'm annoyed, I'm really disappointed that the professional representative body for teachers, such a noble profession, is in such a state of disarray. It annoys me. It really does annoy, annoy me. Um, but what's most disturbing is the fact that potentially it can have an impact on the safety and well-being and welfare of children. And that is crisis, 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 red flag, red flag, red flag. What the hell is going on? Well, thank you, Justin, for your very kind remarks at the start of your uh, your question. And um, I, I have to say, we, we talked earlier on about you know divisions, maybe in council, but there's one thing that all the council members were were united on, and that was the protection of children. There's nobody in the council, nobody who would stand up and say that isn't our our greatest priority. But it seems to be a roadblock. Uh, for us in doing that because uh, that lays outside our remit. We cannot do it. We cannot. It, the, the functions aren't there. We've had expert reports to say, look, um, if, if GTC and I took a case uh, and had a regulatory process and took it, you'd have a 70% chance of losing that case. And the ramifications of losing that case would be worse than never taking the case at all uh, because uh, the, the message it would be sent out would be, you know, there is no regulation. So, um, the, well, there is no regulation at the minute. So, I mean, it's not a good place to be in. Um, I think the department need to be stepping up to the mark. Uh, the legislation needs to be changed. There needs to be a mechanism put in place to do what's happening. It shouldn't be that there's a situation here in the north that's different to somebody in, in Athlone, in Birmingham, in Glasgow or in Cardiff. Everybody should be, uh, there should be the same safeguards to play in all of those jurisdictions. And it's not, they don't apply here. So that's the, that's the difference, that's the priority, uh, as you rightly state. 
that's where we're united in wanting something done about it. But it's outside the remit of the registrar, the chair, the vice chair, or any of the council members. That's outside our remit. We cannot do anything about that. Okay, thanks, Brendan. If it's council members resigned this week from the GTC, why? Well, uh, I, I will. I can't. I can't give you a motive on on what. They they have decided to do what it is. I've seen some of the letters, and they they've said it's dysfunctional. And there is, I have to say, there is a division on council. I mean, teachers. After all, it's a teachers' council. You said your two parents were teachers. It's a teachers' council. Sometimes teachers can be outvoted by people who are not teachers. And uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, when we when we talked about the letter that came in from the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner, uh, or you know. Um, the teachers were very concerned. They were shocked that they were being asked not to answer the questions to the Children's Commissioner. They couldn't believe it. I'm sure if you were to tell your, your parents, you know, ask a teacher to, te to withhold information from the Children's Commissioner, they, they would be shocked. And that's why the teachers were shocked that they were being asked about this. So, I mean, every teacher who attended that meeting voted that those questions be answered. But they weren't answered. And the Children's Commissioner went, those questions went unanswered. And it is, it's maybe, it spells out a, a, a division, but teachers will always, I'm not saying the, the other people who are appointed members wouldn't protect, but you can't tell a teacher not to do something that, that they see as the wealth, to benefit the welfare of children. Uh, and all of the teachers that I know on the council voted that those questions be answered to the Children's Commissioner, because we see the Children's Commissioner as very much on a similar vein to ourselves to protect the children in the education system here. Um, and I, I'm sure if, you, if Siobhan will agree with me that, that that is part and parcel of being a teacher, um, the protection of the young people in, in the education system. And uh, those, well, if, if I were to say to you, I don't know anybody who's resigned who voted to answer those questions to the Children's Commissioner. OK, well, it's a, it's a big concern that people have gone in one week. That's, that's not more red flags, more red flags all over this here. Is one of your roles, uh, Brendan, to provide leadership to the council and to promote cohesion and build relationships? And have you done that effectively, Brendan? Um, well, I've done it to the best of my ability. Um, and Siobhan also has done it to the best of our ability. But if division is the price that we have to pay for doing for standing up for the welfare of children, then division it will be. Um, we, we Children have to come first. The protecting children have to come before, uh, you know, uh, a cohesive council, because um, if, if, in our view, uh, as teachers, um, we will always put the education of children first and the welfare of children first. Um, and sometimes others will have a different opinion. It may be to protect the, the name of the organisation or protect the, the status of the organisation. Um, for me, that would come second. Okay, and and, uh, you said you've uh, communicated over a number of years with the minister. Now, maybe you know these issues have been prolonged, and they've been under the leadership of a number of ministers. And maybe all the ministers have failed to grasp the issues at hand here, and maybe they have failed to, gra to grab the bull by the horns. You have shared with us your communications with the minister. Has the minister replied or sent you communications about the issues within the GTC? My first communication it went unanswered. Uh, my second communication did go uh, was answered by the minister. And by the way, I do not blame the minister for for all the woes in GTC. It's not minister's fault. This this predated this current minister. Um, uh, so I wouldn't lay this at the, the foot of Peter Weir. He's not responsible for everything that's gone on. It, it happened before he came into office. It's, it's something he has inherited. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, he's a hard-working man. He's, he, I'm sure he's well, well respected or whatever for the work he's done. It's landed on his table. Um, I have communicated, and, and as Siobhan will attest, there's a review now taking place into the GTCNI, and it's it's working. So he has reacted, and he has put in place that. Um, in Brand, terms Brandon, of very very briefly, just to be clear, it is the responsible the responsibility of the education minister, whoever that currently is or was to enact legislation to remedy the biggest problem here, which is the inability to regulate teachers, is it not? Yes, I would accept that. Yes, that is. Okay. That is. okay. But I don't, I don't want it to be 
I don't want me to be seen to be targeting the current minister. That's not the purpose of me being here. I wouldn't care which minister. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm not targeting him either. I'm just establishing what you have referred to as a fact previously. Yes. Justin? Yeah. yeah, well, I think I think it's moving on from that. I think it's uh, it's been successful. Ministers have failed to grab the ball by the horns here. And this we need to get into solution mode and tell us how this is going to be fixed. And the minister has a role to play in that. And can you, can you, can you tell us... Brendan, what is the nature of the communication between you and the Minister on the issues ongoing within GTC? Well, the, the only communication I had back from the Minister was that the letter did say that the, um, that a, I think he was upset that I had sent so many messages or communications and that he was putting in place a, you know, a review of GTC and I. Um, my own view is that I think uh, forgetting about communication with me, I think the important thing is that something, an emergency uh, committee is set up to, to change the legislation in the Assembly to make sure that uh, children are protected in the education system. You know, I'm, you know, talking to me is, is fine. I'm not going to change anything in terms of the legislation. It's the minister who will have to change that. Um, so, I've, as I say, like I've had uh, very few communications with him. Um, it's not that informed, I don't Brandon, you informed us that you suspended the registrar when the permanent secretary instructed you to rescind that suspension. What reason or reasons did he give you for that? I, I have to be very careful because that's an ongoing process, uh, Justin, um, and that's still outstanding. So uh, to talk about that, I could prejudice anything that, that would happen in that case. So I would have to be very careful in, in going into that um, uh, matter at all. Um, Okay. Um, right, you paint an alarming picture of the HR issues within GTC, Brendan. In doing so, you inform us that no HR procedures have been initiated or progressed since December 2019. Is it not the Chair of Council's responsibility to ensure that cases are progressed in a timely fashion and in accordance with GTC's HR's policies? Um, yes, and both myself and Siobhan are ex officio members of the HR committee. and. I have to say, even before the current uh, HR committee stepped foot into the office or, you know, was constituted, they already had a backlog of cases that was huge. Um, the organisation, I think, at that stage certainly had one uh, industrial tribunal paint and a number of grievance cases paint. Um, it was huge, even before it started. Uh, there were issues that have come up and since that, I mean, I don't know if you've read the papers to do with the the surveys that, that took place in it. The staff uh, would seem to have a very low morale um, because, uh, according to the survey reports, they have zero zero um, confidence in the HR uh, mechanisms in the in the in the organisation. So they have we're working from a very low base. Um, many of them didn't want to work with the HR provider, so it made the Pro progressing case is difficult. So, yes, it is a, a huge priority that these cases are progressed. Um, but it would have taken... Some of these issues were legacy issues from the previous council. Some of the, the, the HR issues come, came across from the previous council and weren't addressed then. So to slap them on the plate of the new council was a, a very, very hard thing to do um, because m many of the, the, the corporate knowledge of the people who dealt with it in the previous council is gone. Um, so, uh, yes, I see it as a huge priority. The staff in there are our main resource and asset. And we shouldn't have a situation where there's uh, zero morale or very, very low morale. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge issue for them. And it's a okay. problem. Yeah, sorry. Okay, Justin, I need to finish you there. Final comment. Um, I really just again reiterate my perspective that there should be huge prestige attached with the GTC in terms of the representation body for the most noble, one of the most noble professions we have, get it sorted out, get it fixed, get it back on the, on, on the you know, solid footing for, as it should be, for, for the sake of teachers and for the sake of children and young people. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Morris Bradley, MLA. Thanks, Jerry. Can you hear me all right? Yep. 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 Uh, Thanks very much to Ben and Siobhan for their evidence here this morning. Uh, uh, most of the questions have been asked, so a uh, few, just a few issues. What's, what's a blowing report have, have, have not been generated in your tenure? 
and have been an issue since 2014. Just for clarification, would I be right in thinking there have been no issues since you both came into post in 2016? I couldn't tell. The lad, sorry, Morris, because they're, they're, they're confidential, so we don't know. Um, that, that, that's the report that, that we were told about. Um, now, those reports, those whistleblown reports, aren't from 2014. They're from 2018 to 2020, I believe. Um, so, uh, or 2019, sorry. They are mm -hmm. not, they don't go beyond that. They, they, I think the first whistleblown report was in, well, I'm, I'm assuming it was in 2018 or thereabout, thereabouts. Uh, so it's over that two-year period where those whistleblowing reports came in. Um, so I, I can't say we, we don't have access. They're not made through the council because we're in special measures. They would go to the internal auditors, anybody making a whistleblowing complaint. But the, the, the side effect -ish of this, Morris, is that if, if members are told that you're not going to be allowed, that the council's not going to be allowed to see any outcome of whistleblowing complaints. It's almost a detriment or you know, so a, a deterrent to making one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, I must have picked it up wrong there, so I apologise for that, Brenda. But, no, you know, Brenda, it's, it's a worry for me that one of your core functions, uh, the regulation of members and the safeguarding of children through ensuring any, any members who fall foul of the high standards required of an educator uh, are removed from the registration. Based on, uh, on the evidence, I would be of the opinion that relationships within DTC have broken down beyond repair. Would I be right in thinking that? Well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say anything's beyond repair ever. Uh, there's always mechanisms, but it's. It could be that, that I do believe I would accept that there's there are damaged relationships there. But in mm -hmm. any damaged relationships, you need help to put them back to, on a, on a on a sound footing. And I think the uh, the DE. Um, could look at do, putting in place some sort of mediation or some sort of mechanism of getting things back on on track. I do believe that's probably the purpose of the of the review, or else the review is going to make it more more dramatic decision. I don't know, but it would take as a sponsor body the DA to step in and say, look, I take it an impartial view on the matter, and say, look, there there are issues here that are there's differences of opinion or whatever. Um, that we have to get a, a, a way forward. I do believe the way forward is, first of all, to put those whistleblown reports in the into GTC and I let them see where the mistakes have made, and then you can we can move forward from there. I do believe that's a starting point. Um, I I don't ever accept that there's that uh, relationships have broken down to such an extent that you can't move forward. I do believe every relationship can be repaired. To basically cut the tie on it is to give up, and teachers are not in the in the habit of giving up on things. Mm. Thank you. Chair, can I continue? You have enough? Or are we short yes, of time? Last, yeah, last question, Morris. Thanks. Listen, uh, how can GTCNI be, for want of better words, rubbed out and redrawn? And how can this be achieved? And what do you feel needs to be put in place under a new representative organisation uh, to ensure proper scrutiny and regulation while a new structure is being put in place, if that were to be the outcome? Well, uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. There's plenty of good models out there. We don't have to look too far. We can look down south, or we can look at Wales or Scotland. They they all have uh, you know professional teaching bodies that do work and function. Um, so it's not rocket science. All we have to do is look at good practice other, other somewhere else and take it in. I do not know why. Uh, I suppose it's like I don't want to politicise this, but it's like taking the piece of legislation in the RHA thing across and not taking it across completely. We left out some regulation that the other organisations didn't, and it left us weak. Um, and when you're working from a weak legislative basis, uh, you're, you're just looking at problems uh, up the line. And we would need, the legislation is the basis on which GTCNA was set up. It needs to be re-looked at and reformatted and put into a mechanism that, that's fit for purpose in 2021. Okay, thanks for it. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, Chair, thanks for your patience. Thanks, Morrison, and thank all members for their questions. Uh, and Brendan and Siobhan for your time with us today. It's it's quite clear urgent action is needed to remedy a completely unacceptable situation for teachers and children and young people in, in Northern Ireland. So we're grateful for your your evidence that you've given us today to, to help us in in the job that we have to do all that we can to move that forward thank you
Thank you. Okay, can I ask committee broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarize any actions or requests for information resulting from the briefing? Thank you, Chair. Um, there was quite a lot in that session and obviously it's now going to roll on into the, um, the subsequent session as well. Um, but. I think um, there's an urgency coming across um, from the committee that might be best communicated uh, to the minister. Um, certainly in a letter, um, maybe by having a, a follow-up um, briefing um, from, from him or from officials, mm. and possibly even by a committee motion. Um, so um, there was a lot of questioning about whether GTC is at the point where it needs to be abolished, whether it's beyond reform, whether it's beyond repair. Those were the terms that members were, were talking in. Um, the frustration with the fact that GTC is delivering only three of its statutory functions in its current format and that that format has prevailed now for quite some time um, without um, legislation addressing um, the inadequacies there. Um, so uh, the, the, the concern of the committee about um, <clears throat> risk to uh, proper safeguarding of children um, is something I think you know you can't have a measure you can't have any measure of complacency about um so if there isn't proper legal recourse for parental action um you know below a, below a criminal level of sanction um then that's something that the committee would want to interrogate and yeah. ask for change about so really you know um addressing the deficient regulatory framework and the dysfunctionality of GTC and I because it's inadequately supporting teachers and potentially placing children and young people at risk, whether that's by legislation or by accelerating the processes that have been put in place by the department. Um, these resignations, these damaged relationships, you know, there's no proposal of mediation or yeah. roadmap from whistleblowing. Um, so there's a need to set some of this historic um, dysfunction behind. Yeah, thanks. Th yeah. I, I'd agree with that, Clark. Thank, thanks for that. I, th I think at, at, at heart here, we're, the Education Committee has heard today that children are at potential risk. So I, I would agree, Clark, that, and, and seek the agreement of members to write to the Minister of Education to ask what immediate action is being taken to mitigate that potential risk. Um, I would I'd be interested also in requesting the whistleblowing report and uh, details of the referrals that um, has been summarised, I think, by the Children's Commissioner previously. And I, I believe there may also be need for an Education Committee motion to give the Education Minister an opportunity to set out how the sure. deficient regulatory framework and potential risk children are being placed in or being are, are being addressed would, would yeah. members agree that or do you want to add or amend daniel yeah, no I, I agree entirely with your analysis chair what we've heard today is uh, shocking and, and certainly uh, supplements what we've heard in a, in a previous visit from the chief executive of the organization uh, that uh, are watching this today or following this will be alarmed by the serious dysfunctionality of this organization, uh, which is supposed to be a professional body. Uh, there is no doubt that regulation uh, is uh, an issue, but it doesn't entirely feed the reason why the whole thing is so dysfunctional in terms of its daily operation. Um, there is more. Uh, there are other issues that need to be resolved in that regard as well. But we're talking about the potential risk of children. I do agree that we need to act urgently as a committee, uh, given what we have heard today. But we do also need to ensure that we fact check what has been said in these evidence sessions with the department and with uh, the uh, chief executive as well in his evidence session, which is which is forthcoming. Yeah. Just have a, have a, have a, a very br brief concern in relation to this. You know, we listened to the chair and the vice chair uh, uh, previously there, and we thank them for their evidence session. But from the start to the finish of that entire session, all I heard was, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. 
no pathway, no solutions offered in any way, shape or form. And that gives me a very clear uh, 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 signal um, that these problems will not be easily resolved and we would be looking at a very strained time frame uh, in resolving this matter. So okay. it, it may be the case, Chair, that not only just do we need urgent action in relation to address the safeguarding issues for children, but also the general functionality of this organisation. And we need to really focus on the question as to whether or not it's appropriate to continue and whether it should be replaced. Okay. Um, sure. and, and yeah, Robin, con a conscious that we do have the Chief Executive to come in as well. But Robin, yes, go ahead. No, no, I accept, accept that, Chair. Sure. That, that, I'm sure that would be interesting. Uh, Chair, sure, uh, I did refer to the special measures or the special measures. My understanding is special measures come with a plan of a route out of special measures uh, and if we could try to understand what that route map uh, out, out of special measures was agreed with, with the organization i think the other one chair this was raised back in 2014 i think was the mm -hmm. first date that were given uh by brendan i'd like to try and understand i think the minister was minister o'dowd at that time Mm -hmm. I'd like to try to understand what were the issues that were raised in 2014 and then uh, obviously what issues were addressed between 2014 and us going down uh, uh, for, for that. And Brendan also referred to that they had sought advice from a barrister who indicated that indeed it was a relatively simple, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that was the, certainly the impression given. If, if that information could also be uh, the, uh, pr provided to us, it would help us immediately understand what a professional legal opinion was on, on, on the issues that needed to be resolved. Mm. We can request that. Um, can I come in, please? Yeah, William, go ahead. Yeah, um, just on the point that Robin makes there about special measures, I mean, I asked um, the chairman about special measures and about the special measures twice. And so there were have been two route maps out of, out of the difficulties. If these issues go back to 2014, again, I asked that. Um, it could well even stretch beyond 2014. It does seem to me, to be honest, that this organisation isn't fit for purpose because we've now heard from the chief executive and the chair and the vice chair. Relationships seem to have broken down irreparably, in my opinion. So I think one of the things we should do in terms of um, actions from today is I think we should seek a meeting and ask the permanent secretary of the department, I know he's a new permanent secretary, uh, to come before the committee around the issue as well. Okay. Um, members, there seems to be a agreement there that we, I, 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 propose, I think we invite the minister for education and Department of Education officials um, to give them an opportunity to come to the committee and, as you say, speak to special measures and, and what action is going to be taken to remedy a situation that many people are referring to as no longer fit for purpose. Chair, Conscious just, that we have the chief executive to come as well here. Sorry, someone else wanted to come in there? Yeah, yeah. Just very briefly, Chair, and I know I've, I've um, taken a fair bit of time. You know, on, the, on considering what has been said by the chair of the organisation uh, and, and, and saying that children are potentially, potentially at risk, which is a very serious alarm for us as committee members uh, 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 of, 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 of the Department of Education. But I think, I think Chair of the Assembly, sorry, I think, Chair, you know, when you, when you, when you scratch the surface, that would indicate that children there thereby have been at risk since 2012 2013 maybe is that, is that is that really what's been said here because of the lack of regulation because if you look if you look at this and, and you look back uh, when when the power of the department ended in terms of regulation and gtc would regulate they failed to regulate because of the legislation then the department couldn't take control again uh, because their power had lapsed so so there's been a real serious uh, minister, uh, failure on the, part of, uh, on the part of the minister of the day, previous or current, uh, to deal with this issue. And as a result, since 2014, definitely since 2014, that analysis that children are potentially at risk would stand to this present day, which is seven years. Yeah, that, seven. That, I, th I think that's a logical conclusion, uh, Daniel, which is completely unacceptable and... I, and I doubt any of the members of this education committee, will 
let that situation rest. Can I move us on to our next evidence session, given we've only got the 12 o'clock members? Yeah. Okay, Clark, did you get enough um, actions there? I certainly did. Yeah, okay. I mean, the Permanent Secretary would be responsible as accounting officer for the governance review on that that's going on. So it may be that there will you know, be some comeback from the department about who should attend the committee in the, in the near future. But certainly. Content for, the, content for the committee to give the Minister, the Permanent Secretary, senior officials uh, the opportunity to come to the committee and um, they can decide who they wish to send them. Um, Thank you. Okay, can I uh, ask uh, committee broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add the witnesses for our next session, which is the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland Chief Executive Oral Briefing. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the GTC NI Chief Executive in table papers? A GTC NI response providing minutes of GTC NI Council meeting on the 10th of March 2021 at page 103 and welcome Sam Gallagher, the Chief Executive of the General Teaching Council, Northern Ireland. Can you hear us okay, Sam? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, yes. We can't see you, but we can hear you clearly. I'm sorry. And... I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Up here. That's us. Thank you. Um, Sam, we're extremely short for time today, but we'll give you an opportunity to make opening remarks before we take questions, if that's okay. Um. Okay, um, really, obviously, this is a concerning situation, and I was listening to the evidence session of the chair and the vice chair. You know, there is a lot that the chair said that I would tend to agree with. I think there's the issue in the organisation, or certainly we've, the committee's identified and I outlined before, which is around regulation and the legislative framework. Uh, you know, as I said before, we, we regulate in a dynamic situation where case law changes all the time and therefore your legislation needs to keep up with that. So whenever the regulations were developed in 20, 2015 um, to the, and applied to the GTC and I, I would say at the time that those regulations and the approach to uh, regulation was I mean, I can't comment, it was pretty sound, but as we come to implement it, it was quite clear that case law and other legislation had changed, and therefore there was a need for us to, on council advice, to change the approach that we were we were taking or the approach that we were advocating wasn't going to work. So there is the issue around regulation that needs to be addressed. Um, so that's clear. However, on the other side of the organisation, in moving out of, in terms of special measures, there quite clearly is, in light of obviously a reflection on the resignations that have occurred this week, there are issues within the council itself and its operation, and those do impinge now onto the operational side that 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 I'm having to to, to manage uh, and deliver on. So there is there is issues there uh, in terms of the roadmap out of special measures. There are issues regarding you know, uh, that's come out from internal audit reports that we know we need to address and we need to move forward on those. So in terms of the way forward, the way forward is relatively clear. Um, however, you know, the operation of council is a concern uh, and uh, that's something that, that, that needs, needs, to be, needs to be addressed and hence forward into the review. I also think that you know, listening to the evidence, there was obviously a preoccupation about whistleblowing and the number of, I mean, I'm not party to the detail of, of what those complaints were, but I suspect that some of them would relate to matters that should really be addressed in, in a board within itself or within the organisation itself. Um, so, it, and you know, to play up a situation to say that it's really bad presupposes that what was put in on 112 complaints were all valid complaints. So, you know, I can only speak for the things that I've been asked to comment on and respond to the permanent secretary and responded to that. And, and you know, the, the explanations given were accepted. So um, that's all I can say. So I think there's maybe an overemphasis on on this whole idea of whistleblowing. But certainly the two things from, from the three things from my point of view are, you know, one is the regulatory side of the house and the legislation legislative framework. Um, the other side is the functioning of council itself, um, you know, to operate as a, as, a, as a board should operate. And I think there are issues there. 
And in the middle, I think there are the operational issues reflected in our internal audit recommendations that we need to take forward to uh, you know, in terms of our own processes and, uh, uh, and some of the areas in the way that we work within the organization to move forward. Um, but overall, you know, the fact that the board doesn't operate or its situation spins over and spills over into the, into the uh, organization itself. Okay, th thanks, Sam. Uh, so there are regulatory board functionality and operational issues um, that the Education Committee has heard potentially uh, put, put children and young people at potential risk. Do you want to respond to that? Well, I think it's just... It's I think it's, the answer to your question is much as it was the last time I gave evidence to the committee. You know, there are weaknesses in the regulatory framework that we have to operate on means that we can't really regulate. But if our powers at the minute are only to remove a teacher from the register, register, um, and, you know, we can't do that without fear of, of significant challenge and a high probability of failure, it then says, well, you know, if we look down the caseload that we have at the minute, how many of those cases do you think would end up with somebody being suspended for life from the register? And I think, you know, without, you know, based on the information that we currently have and without going full investigation process, the truth is those numbers would be pretty, would be relatively small, I would think, in relation to the number of cases, but that doesn't mean that we do it. Now, on the other hand, is that, is our other elements at risk? If you had a range of sanctions, then we'll argue that there are cases that or situations that would occur within the teaching profession, the day-to-day -day work that we might take a view in a regular capacity on uh, that wouldn't be warranting removal from the register for life, but would actually maybe be the conditional registration or recommendation for training or supervision that other regulatory bodies do, but we don't have a range of sanctions to apply. So, you know, so we are only really regulating the most severe cases, uh, but in the most severe cases, there aren't, from what I can see down our caseload, there's not a significant number. Okay. Um, it's helpful to understand the proportion and quantum, but if there's one thing this education committee isn't going to accept, it's children being a potential risk. Um, is, there, is there a risk? And the answer to that is there, has to be, there is a risk at the moment, yes. And, and how long is it going to take to address the regular regulatory board and operational issues that appear to be creating that potential risk? Well, I think I think what well the potential risk in the regulatory function is probably more to do with legislation. Okay, the legislation and process. So really, the the big. The key determining factor is the development on the revision of and implementation of new introduction of new legislation. Um, once the nature of that legislation is known, we can then put in an, a, an approach to regulation. But the approach to regulation would probably be along the lines that we have, we already advocated, which is like an independent independent approach. But that would have to be put in place and begin to move forward. Now, ideally, as legislation is developed. You know, and you can see how that's happening. There's proprietary work you could be in tandem. So to answer your question around timeline, I mean, I can only repeat the advice that we've been given from the indication from the department, which is to say it could take up to two years to do this. Is that an acceptable length of time? Um, the situation we find ourselves, I wouldn't say it's acceptable, but, you know, it is what it is unless it can be short-circuited and then it, or made it produced any quicker. Um that would be that would be my view, but I mean, what council? The legal advice that we've received from council is that it really needs a, you know, a, an overhaul in terms of what it means for the range of sanctions that are open to GTC and I, uh, and then the, the power to implement a an independent process to allow that to take forward to go forward. Okay, uh, members, we've got about three to four minutes maximum per question per member. Um, so can I bring in uh, Pat Shane, Deputy Chairperson? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks for that, Sam. Um, we've heard very disturbing evidence today, and you've confirmed it, that there is potential safeguarding risks. 
uh, and, and you said the same the last time you were in front of the committee. Uh, I want to touch on some correspondence between the, the GTC and the Children's Commissioner and the involvement of a, a DE official because the Children's Commissioner had asked important uh, and pertinent questions uh, and the the response is, is very worrying. Um, the DE uh, official seemed to be more concerned about protecting the uh, reputation of the GTC rather than being open and transparent uh, with the Children's Commissioner. So, for example, uh, he said, you must consider the reputation and good standing of the council and defend these as fully as possible. Uh, and he then went on to say, or this person, I'm not sure it was a man or a woman, it is important that whatever you say can be owned by the waiter council. How you secure that waiter council ban will be something yourself and the vice chair should consider. Uh, since this must be a GTCNI response, it would be wrong for the department to directly steer you in what you say. However, I would note that your suggested response on the background to and current handling of teacher regulation seems to sell the council's efforts a little short. Can, can you explain to us why uh, some officials would, would not want to cooperate with the Children's Commissioner in a, a full and transparent manner? Thanks. I don't... Uh, um, I, I don't think that that advice that was given to the Chair, I can think was un, unreasonable. I mean, I wasn't there at the time when the letter, the correspondence from Nicky to me uh, arrived uh, and uh, you know when I did say it I said I would, we would respond to it accordingly um, so I didn't think it was reasonable I, I, unreasonable um, you know I think it was a bit important in terms of dealing with uh, dealing and responding to Nikki was my view all the time I said at the council was to be transparent and to give them the information but at the same time it's also how we would present that information in a way that it, you know, we cannot turn around and say and be honest that the organisation was going to hell in a handcart because we weren't. Um, that doesn't mean to say that that there there aren't concerns around the regulatory situation. I'm to be honest about that. You know, suffice to say that you know we addressed the matter with Nicky. You know, we, we met with Nicky, uh, went through a number of things with Nicky, had follow up with that, and the situation was resolved to to their satisfaction, and they've written to to confirm that. Okay. Final supplementary, Pat. Uh, okay, well, I, I mean, given the content of the letter from the DE official, I mean, I would be concerned that there wasn't full transparency uh, and openness with um, uh, the Children's Commissioner at that time. And I suppose it points up the, the level of dysfunctionality within GTC at the minute. But how, how can they... Tell us, Sam, how can the organisation move on from this, uh, the myriad of problems and dysfunctionality that has consumed the GTC? Thanks. Well, just to get the earlier point, Pat, I don't think that we were, in, in responding to Nicky, were, were, had any lack of transparency and weren't factually correct in, in, in the response that went forward. So I would, I would contest that, and I don't think it was any, any attempt to, to, to mislead. But taking your second point there, how to move forward? I mean, I think I think I think council needs to needs to act as, as one, and I think there are disparate views in council as to as to you know what the purpose of the organisation is and how that should be trans translated into into operation. Um, I also think that there's a fracture in relationships that needs to be resolved. Um, and there's just a very high level of mistrust. And I think even in the operations of council that I can see, there is a sort of a disregard for the normal conventions that would apply between a board and the way a board would operate and its and its executive. And, you know, those things need to be recognised. They need to be addressed. And, you know, my suggestion, and I put it in my briefing paper to you, was, you know, it was suggested that the governance framework needed to be revised, needed to tidy up some of the loose ends that are there that are causing points of, if you like, some points of concern. 
So, but that hasn't been accepted, and so those things need to be grasped. But council council needs to to operate as one, and it's not operating as one. And there, you know, there are, as I can see, active, you know, there are active attempts at disruptive behaviour that I can okay. see. Okay, thanks. Um, that, I think that does. Thanks, Pat. That demonstrates we've got time for a question, a short answer, a supplementary, and a short answer. And I can kind of bring in Robin Newton, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you to Sam for coming back again to, to see us. Uh, this can't be a very pleasant uh, time for you. I'm sure it's not the highlight of your professional uh, life. I, I, the, the, the deputy chair really took uh, part of my question there, chair, on how it can be brought back into to, uh, fully functioning. And but Sam, can I just ask the question? And this is my only question, chair. Uh, well, it's two two questions, I suppose. Were you privy to the um, uh, as as uh, Brendan referred to us, were you privy to the information that a barrister uh, was asked to look at and which was not wishing to put words in his mouth, but was described as relatively simple, relatively uh, legal advice that this could be put right quite quickly. And can I ask you some, how much of this is down to just personalities, strong personalities with their own uh, views on uh, how things should be done. Well, to answer your first point there on, on council advice, yes, we requested council advice on the procedures and that council advice did, did come in and the council had pointed out where the weaknesses were, yes, because that advice did come to me um, and then was considered by our policy and regulation committee and then through the council. I also made the department aware of that advice. Uh, a second, we had met with we met with the permanent secretary, if I recall, back in June 2019 on this matter, uh, and a second opinion. The permanent secretary asked for a second opinion, so advice was then obtained in, in August, which which backed up really what the advice we had been been given in the first instance. Um, it, I don't think it's the advice. The words in the advice was that this is relatively simple to fix. What the, what was pre presented verbally to me by by council was that they they said that the this you know legislation would be required. There are a number of areas that need to be tightened up, but, but it was relatively straightforward and suggested you know that really what we need to do here is really to operate in a way that wheels operate. So so then their legislation would be something similar, and that's what we could look at. So that's really what that means in that. On your second point, is it? Do I feel it's down to strong personalities and strong? Um, I don't think it's necessarily down to strong personalities. What 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 is going on within council? I think, I think, and I get, I get the impression there are other forces that work in there, and there's, you know, things actively there to either undermine individuals and like for like for example the issue around membership. Why with the issues around membership? brought up by one member who writes to the chair and then the chair, they want to take this on. What, rather than bring the matter to the council for the council to discuss and determine whether it has, if there's an issue with this, um, you know, why that's brought up a year into the council, you know, just seems to me rather, rather, rather strange. And there's been a number of things like that, 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 that come up and, uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't look to me that it's just strong personalities. There's, there's, okay. there's intent in some things. That's what it looks to me. Brief supplementary, okay. Robin. Are you content? No, I'm content with that, Chair. Thank you to Sam. Thanks, Robin. I'm sorry to have to press people so um, much here. Apologies. Uh, Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Sam, for being with us today again. Uh, we do appreciate your time. Uh, and... Uh, this is absolutely a very challenging time for this council and obviously you as chief executive. Um, we, I don't even know where to start. The, the, the detail of what is emerging generally is just shocking completely. Um, I, I want to start first of all in relation to the issues around uh, child safety. Um, you know, we, we've heard the concerns expressed. You uh, shared them with us in your 
on your first visit to this committee and uh, the chair and vice chair uh, shared uh, similar concerns today. But I want to specifically look at the regulation. So in 2012 or around it, uh, it's my understanding that the, the department came to the GTC and I and says, OK, right, you have to regulate now. Uh, and uh, we we will no longer regulate it. It's over to the GTC and I. And then at that point, there was stumbling blocks and difficulty and, and, and uh, that the, the basically GTC couldn't regulate. So on that basis, is it fair for me to say that these concerns around the safeguarding of children would stand as far back as maybe 2012, Sam? Um, I think, no, I... I I don't think that that is the case in the sense that the regulations that transferred power to GTCI to regulate were the 2015 regulations. Mm -hmm. So prior to the 2015 regulations, GTC didn't have the power to regulate, so that was sitting with the department, okay, mm -hmm. to remove teachers in that regard. So it only moved from 2015. Now, whenever you got the regulations that came in in 2015 and that power moved over to GTCI, then GTCI needed to put in a process that was that was reg to regulate and it was in putting in that process and developing that process around uh if you like through independent plans and independent process that that's when the gaps began to emerge to say that well actually our legislation doesn't allow us to do that because the power of the council cannot delegate to outside of itself so it's those kinds of things that emerged then so the frustration really emerged through trying to put a put a process in place from, 25, from 2015 when those regulations came into place. And then really, whenever we got a, there was agreement uh, of a way forward with the department in 20, in January 2019. And then subsequent to that, in May uh, 2019, council uh, so opinion being received that says this won't work. Now, one could argue, you know, as I said at that time, why was council opinion only coming in then? Surely it would yep. have been something you would have got out there. But. And Sam, um, the difficulties that you've just uh, touched on there in relation to finding a way forward with the department, was the issue in resolving that directly related to the collapse of the institutions in the absence of a minister? Well, I think I think we we were told that obviously legislation can't be passed because there's no assembly, and therefore that that, okay. that, yeah. that is an issue. You know? That's fine, Sam. So so basically, by default, the absence of the institutions, the collapse of the institutions, put our children at risk for three further years because they couldn't legislate. So Correct. children in Northern Ireland were put at risk. There was no legislation that could be put in place because of the absence of a minister. Utterly, absolutely appalling. Absolutely appalling. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Just another point, Sam. Final, final supplementary, Daniel. Chair, thanks. I asked, chair, I asked the chair and the vice chair this question in relation to particular individuals that may seek election to the GTC and I council uh, deliberately to disrupt, sabotage, and as some would have described to me, to bring it down. Would you say that is an accurate reflection of the intent of some people or not? Well, I can only go by, I, I know that, uh, I, I know of one of the members who stood on that platform and that, I mean, they articulated that in, in writing that that's the platform they wanted to come on. I, I can go by others who, who have, I can recall one member who told me that before they even reduced their name to me. Uh, and I have to be honest, in some cases I have seen behaviours that would not dissuade me otherwise. Uh, in okay. writing, is that, in, in writing, the person that declared that in writing, is it, the chair or vice chair currently? No, not the not okay. the other. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I, th I think that is a fair point. I think anyone who doubts the significance of the absence of an executive or assembly need only look at the case at hand and the inability to enact legislation that is needed to support teachers and protect children. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, please? I think you need to unmute your device, Robbie. Uh, that's twice. Thank you, Chair. Um, you can add that on to the three minutes. Thanks, Sam, for joining us. Yeah, I think um, Daniel raises a good point. There's, there's been many, many years wasted, three years of uh, no government, but now we've had uh, probably been further compounded by uh, 16 months of lockdown where our children, um, and especially those more vulnerable children, um, have, have lost that 
that's safeguarding um, and, and there's many, many lost opportunities. So hopefully today we'll bring those things to, to a, a pinnacle. Um, Sam, thanks for joining us today again. Um, we, we obviously had the chair and the vice chair on. There was something that um, the chair had, had intimated towards the end that, that piqued my interest and that was with regard to the implication that there was a division on the, the council in relation to openness and the ability to be open on council. Um, it, would that be your summation of the performance of the council? Um, I think I think there are concerns in that there would be concerns in that arena. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, quite clearly from the minister's letter that I have seen, there's been quite a lot of correspondence between the chair and the uh, the minister and DE officials. You know, and if the chair is writing in the capacity as chair of council, then it would follow that you really should share that information with the council as to what it's writing about on their behalf. Well, can I, can I, I ask you on that? Because this was my main I don't question. See that, I don't see that happening. And therefore... This, this, this is my main question. I asked, um, I'm interested in the implied authority or the delegated authority of the chair with regard to correspondence. Does the chair speak for C, uh, DTCNI and on behalf of the council? Or does you know, what authority does the chair actually have? Well, I think that it's the body corporate has an executive authority, so okay. everybody else, those individuals are non-executive. But if the chair, in my opinion, if the chair is writing to anyone, citing the fact that they're chair of GTC and I, then it follows that they're writing, they're ref reflecting the views of the council or writing on their behalf. So, you know, to my mind, it's incumbent that they should make sure that they're reflecting the views of the council and not the views, our personal opinion or the, or the agenda or opinion of a few. Um, and, you know, one of the things was when the minister replied uh, regarding indicating the, the, the letter in October indicating the review, you know, the natural question from some members of council was, can we see the correspondence that prompted that? And the answer from the chair was, no, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, wouldn't share that. So but, but remember, these, that's, the, that's, the same, that's the same issue that um, Brent levelled at, I suppose, with regard to the whistleblower and the allegations about GTC and I, that those weren't being made public, but then we've got the same thing happening with the chair with regard to uh, a, a, a subject access requests. Well, they're, they're, I mean, I can only go from my experience and as chair, I, or sorry, as chief executive, um, responsible for ensuring the resources, the money, and how we spend our money, public money properly. You know, I all I can see from my perspective is that there are blurred lines between what is gen council business and what is possibly the agenda of a, a individual or a group of individuals, um, and that's those lines are blurred to me. Okay, my final question. Thank you, Sam. Um, do you believe at any stage was it the case that anyone um, either misled or wanted to hide anything in order to protect a reputation? Um, uh, perhaps at the expense of, of uh, safeguarding of children with regard to no, non-compliance or not sharing of information? No, I don't think that at all. You know, my, my view, but, you know, if you're, if you're referring to the Nikki type of correspondence, when people, you know, organisations write to me, our, our job is to be as transparent as possible. Now, it may well be you have to be diplomatic in some of those things, but but the truth is we need to, you know, uh, answer, answer, you know, be as transparent as we can. You know, what we don't want to be doing is scaremongering unnecessarily, you know, and that, that, that would be my concern. No, I appreciate that. And this is the final one in terms of, in terms of that you're absolutely right. And there's absolutely no uh, reason anybody should scaremonger. But um, with regard to, and this question was asked to the, the chair and the vice chair, what, what level of risk is there to safeguarding of our children at the moment? And uh, I think you might have answered this previously, but, uh, you know, uh, and the last time you were with, with us, but. Could you okay, give us well, a the, 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 the fundamental position at the minute is is that employers have their responsibility to implement their procedures both in recruitment and in their disciplinary procedures around allegations and uh, and regarding misconduct in school and that's the first point of call and those procedures may end up in a teacher being dismissed okay or if it's a really very very serious case then either through the, a criminal process or even through the school referring the matter to DBS, the Disorder and Barring Service, who then do their undertake their work. And if they, in the end of the day, decide that someone should be barred from involvement with children, they would let us know and we would remove them from the register um, in that regard. Now, because we aren't regulating what we would be doing on the back of some of those things would be 
taking a professional view that says, do we think this person has brought the reputation and profession into, into disrepute? Do we think they pose a risk? We would do an investigation process, and the outcome of that process may well be that a decision is taken to remove that teacher from the register. So okay. in that sense, that bit is removed. So in theory, what could happen is that a teacher gets dismissed from a school or resigns and could be employed in another school if the school don't do fully their checks because you know we, we haven't been able to act. So there is an element of risk that's there. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Thank Robbie. You. Thank you. Uh, Sam, really quickly, in, in correspondence we've received, it says that following a council meeting, a, a general teaching, teaching council meeting, on the 26th of March, 2021, the General Teaching Council is now implementing a revised screening process for uh, misconduct referrals. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that we changed in uh, the light of the McKee ruling, we've, we proposed a change to our screening process uh, to, uh, you know, so that officers could not take the decisions. It's relates back to the powers of the powers of the council. So we are implementing a revised screening process that allows us to screen our cases, which is basically the first stage, which is determining should a case go forward to investigation or should a referral be closed. So that process was we're setting in place now. So well, the first step in that is to bring all our records up to date and provide the necessary information, and then to move forward with a process that involves myself and a, and a couple of members of council. To make those decisions. Okay, um, I'd maybe like to know more about that, but time is uh, against me. Um, William, for a question and a supplementary question. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Morning, Mr. Gallagher, and thanks again for joining us. Mr. Gallagher, I understand from information we've had and the evidence given that the TTC has been placed in special measures on two, two occasions. Am I right in saying then the two route maps, uh, route maps out of that? particular scenario have been presented and were they followed? Uh, well, I can't speak for the first time because I wasn't in the organization at that first time in 2016-17. Um, but on the back of uh, reviews, there was a, an action plan to be followed. Um, and that was part of it was around my, my appointment. Um, and that's what I came to do to try and implement that, that program. It has been a bit frustrating and uh, the big frustration really came after about six six months. And I think it, it was in light of ongoing correspondence um, going to the council that created then concerns within council members about their contact details being circulated. Uh, there were a few other matters that came up and then that the department wanted to do a bit more oversight in September. And then with the situation regarding the transition to the new council and the difficulties around the election of the chair and things like that, things like that the, the, the department decided to put the organization in the special measures again. So, you know, the route map out, there's an operational route map out, but in terms of the route map for council, there needs to be a route map there to be done but really for the council to function because the council quite clearly is not functioning and the resignations, I think, Regrettably, yeah. or so the, are you telling us then the council is not following the route map that was set out in conjunction with the department or by the department? Um, I think the the council we were trying to. You mean part of it was developing corporate plan, part of it was getting settled structure, part of it was looking certain. We've been endeavouring to do all of that, but uh, you know it has been frustrating, and I think aspects of council have frustrated that. So, you so know, just by the operation of council has frustrated that. Do you mean do you mean aspects of council? Do you mean elements of the council have frustrated it? I would just say, I would just say the oper the way the council is operating has frustrated that. You know, well, I think, think you know, high levels of correspondence, you know, refusing to, you know, whenever there are quite clearly issues that could be resolved, their internal issues could be resolved internally. A reluctance for people to do that, but wishing to conduct business outside in the public domain, doesn't help. Well, I think I think when an organisation has been placed in special measures twice, and it's had a route map given to it twice, the failure to implement the route map, put in place the 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 um, practices, procedures, and policies, or whatever needed to do that, is absolutely appalling. I have to say, whoever is responsible for it, can I ask you, why did you people resign this week? You know. Um. Well, I think they. The 
going by the information that's been cited in the resignation, they've been concerned about the functioning of the council. Um, there is concern that, you know, whether whether the chair recognised or not, people must feel that they're being bullied and harassed, um, uh, and they just are concerned about that the council is not pulling together, and you know, business isn't being conducted. Uh, the meetings, certainly, the meetings have been for the past year. I would determine to be ineffectual. Um, that's spilling over into the operational side of the house, and I think some people have probably got just got fed up with it and have their concerns. That's well, finally, been... uh, in terms of relationships, um, what does the GTC council look like um, whenever your um, council actually meets? What does it look like in terms of relationships, and are relationships? so badly damaged that they're irreparably damaged and that this organization is in fact dysfunctional? Um, my observations at meetings, I find them very confrontational. Okay, They're confrontational to degree and, ad, and can be ad, adversarial. I think there are matters that come, are, are, you know, there's a feeling that when issues are raised, they're not fully, fully aired and um, you know, concerns aren't, aren't being addressed. There's a feeling on some, I suggest, that it looks like some things are a witch hunt unnecessarily for, again, certain individuals on matters that are not really, really important. You know, so there's a number of concerns that are made. And can relationships be I mean, my suggestion was that the council really needs some sort of facilitated workshop to begin to you know, resolve some of these differences and move forward. My concern in that was that, you know, my question was, would, would everybody and everybody, you know, enter into that in the right sort of spirit of wanting to make, make the organization work? And, you know, the answer is, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not sure about, about that. So our relationship so bad now and broken down so much that they're, they are irreparably um, damaged and the organization cannot function as currently constituted? I think it's a difficult situation, you know, I can't, that's a direct, it's a difficult situation, you know, but okay, clearly there is no consensus view. I think if I get a sense of consensus view about what the organization is about and the direction it should be going. Yes, we've got a corporate plan, which was good, but it's a bit torturous to get to that point. Um, but I'm not sure if everybody has bought into that. And, you know, if people are saying, well, if I don't agree with that, then we've got a transient. So it's, Okay. Very rationalized, I would say. Okay. Thanks, William. No, thank you. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. And again, thanks, Sam, for attending here this morning. Um, I just want to touch upon how the council is supposed to work and your role as chief executive. How are how do you work with um? the chair and vice chair of the council um how are you supposed to work with them and what's your relationship like with the other members and how what's the relationship supposed to be like with them well in terms of first of all working working with the chair um the relationship which currently exists and existed since the beginning of 2020 is not what i would envisage a proper working relationship between a chair and the executive should be okay um we don't meet regularly. We don't, you know, we don't. Uh, everything's done on email, um, so it, it's difficult. Okay, it's difficult. Not for the want of trying. So it's difficult. Relationship with other council members. I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, I try to do my job, um, but quite clearly, you know, uh, we, we're you're trying to operate in very difficult circumstances in in relation to the board. I just get an impression that there are different agendas at work, um, and that's not helping. So why is it so poor, Sam? Why, whose fault is that? Well, like, why is it so fractured? Or why are you only communicating via email? Do you know why is it? Well, I think you need to ask the chair that. I mean, my first meeting with them after they were chair was to me my job to work with anybody and was to say, well, how do you want to work? I never really got a straight answer to that. I did offer them said we should meet maybe at least you know, once a month or whatever, but that's never, never materialized and everything's just, just an email. That's sort of my main uh, question to you. Look, surely that's shared responsibility. Is that not part of your role as chief executive to create that relationship? 
No, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't say that I, well, I think I've, I've been numerous overtures for that to work. I've given advice. I've done how things should work. You know, it takes two people to tango, you know. Absolutely. Well, that leads me on then to the role you've played in addressing reports of bullying, especially with female members of the organisation. What role have you played in that? Well, all I can say is that uh, there has been female members of the board, um, the council who have spoken to me in relation to correspondence they received and feeling feeling bullied. And, you know, how, how do they do it? How do they handle that? And I've just advised them accordingly. How do they handle that? That's the way people feel. Uh, and I've advised them, advised them accordingly what they, what they should do. In terms of accusations of bullying within, within the organisation, you know, um, again, all I can say was there was a, a survey appeared. There was, uh, you know, the council, they took it out of my hands, the council took action on that. The uh, HR provider came in, was had a presence on site. They met with staff. They had focus groups. They did all of that. People were advised of how they can raise issues, and you know, the issues were raised. So you know, I can't comment any more than that. Okay, listen, I suppose it's clear from today's meeting and others that there are serious issues, and we all um, accept that there. Um, but thank you, Sam. I appreciate the information. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Is, John, is it Morris Bradley at this point, then? Morris Bradley? Is Morris still there? Yep. Can you hear us, Morris? No. Morris is okay. on mute. Morris, are you on? Is your device on mute? Maybe he's just not on his screen at the moment. Okay, no problem. Um, I think we're we're almost out of time as it is anyway, Clark. So okay, um, Sam, uh, can I thank you for again for meeting with us today and for your evidence? Um, there, there's obviously a need for urgent action in relation to. Uh, as you say, the, the regulatory board functionality and operational matters in relation to GTC and, uh, and Education Committee will continue to do all we can to um, ensure urgent action in response to those. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Clark, can I ask committee broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and ask if there are any other actions uh, you need to raise with us further to that briefing? I think the, the actions do follow on from, from the last session. Um, okay. That was obviously the perspective of registrar uh, as opposed to the, the perspective of council. Um, and um, it is a main concern that the regulatory framework um, only affords UTC the power to remove teachers from the register for life. And there's the high probability of challenge and likelihood of failure if every time they go to do that. They need to have a range of sanctions to be effective. Um, um, and really, I mean, it's up to the committee, you know, whether they think that a, a, a timeline of two years to remedy this is... Um, you know, is, is fast enough. Um, uh, so the the regulatory the roadmap out of special measures um, will be uh, in response to regulations of internal audit, and obviously those will be both for um, the body corporate and um, the council. Um, so, I mean, if members have particular additional requests to make in correspondence or other actions, um, I'm happy to. Take okay. Members, any other points you wish to raise? Uh, I think that's a fairly comprehensive list of actions mm -hmm. and I may well circulate draft text for a potential education committee motion, but yeah. content with those actions at this moment in time? Content, Chair. Chair. Just to yeah. Chair. Sorry, Rob, Robin, Robin first. Yeah, Chair. Um, yeah, I, th I think the committee clerk has a, an excellent uh, summary of where we are. Chair, it is absolutely obvious that the body needs a fully functioning professional body 
mm -hmm. uh, to, to the, the profession needs a fully functioning professional body to to uh, steer it uh, in, in the right direction. And indeed, sure, the safeguarding of children has to be uppermost uh, in, in our mind. And, and I think it was actually Daniel who raised the question about whether or not, you know, this, this has been ongoing from uh, at least 2014 when the first uh, issues we were told were raised up, up until the up until today, and this should be a, a statutory, a salutary lesson to anyone who's thinking about collapsing the assembly for whatever reason. But can I ask you this, Chair, in terms of uh, the, the urgency of this, uh, and I think it would be helpful if the members would agree that uh, yourself on behalf of the uh, committee uh, send a, a press statement out on on our concerns at this stage uh, and indeed our, our the, the desire of the committee to do all that we can to actually bring uh, the, the, the matter uh, back in, in into sync. And I do and I know the committee clerk has said this, but I think it's absolutely urgent that we get either the department, the perm sack, or indeed the minister uh, for us, whatever is felt appropriate at this stage, Chair, as a matter of urgency to uh, see how we uh, can help in taking this matter forward. Happy to, happy to do that, Robin. Yep, agreed. Any other <coughs> members wish to come in briefly? Yeah, uh, Chair. Yes, uh, it's ju just in relation to a, a, a number of points. <laughs> the, the, the more this goes on, the more concerning it, it becomes. I do think that it is important that we stress uh, our uh, very strong concern in relation to uh, the safeguarding of children, uh, and, and I think that's obvious to uh, the committee. I do agree with your committee motion uh, suggestion, and uh, I think that that uh, is a good way forward. But that all aside, you know, th there are serious issues internally between personalities, obviously, that need to be resolved, aside from the regulation. Um, you know, the core function of this this council needs to be looked at, um, and um, it, it needs to be restructured and reformed uh, as well to ensure that even if regulation was in place, because that's not just the only issue here, even if it was in place that we just don't end up back square one. The, the other thing is there was a point made, Chair, about special measures uh, previous to Sam's uh, appointment as chief executive of the organization. The uh, body was in uh, special measure and managed to navigate a pathway out of it and then ultimately ended up back in it again uh, sometime later. So it, it just worries me that there is no detail as to what the suggested or planned path out of special measures is. It just looks as though the thing is spinning around on its head at this stage, and as a consequence, children and the profession is going to suffer. So I, we two years, my point here is, Chair, as the clerk has mentioned, two years. Two years is definitely absolutely not an option um, at all, uh, and uh, th th this needs to be treated with utmost urgency. Uh, we can't allow this to linger, the Minister. And just to make this point, this committee, I'm sure, and every member of this committee will support the minister by whatever means necessary to bring about legislation to rectify and remedy these issues as swiftly as possible. Okay. Members members agreed. Can I just William briefly, yeah. Yeah. Um look, Chairman, this is this is something there used to be a um, comedy series on TV years ago called Soap. And at the end of each you'll be too young to remember it probably. But at the end of each um episode they used to say things will become clearer after the next episode um things uh, are clearly no having listened to two sets of evidence today um i'm none the wiser uh this organization has been put in special measures twice it may have had a route map out the first time but i think in terms of the line of questioning i had with mr gallagher the 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 end there it's very clear that personalities whatever and i'm not taking sides and the of preventing this organization from coming out of the second set of measures and the route map that was put in front of them. So this is this is probably beyond seven years, closer to 10 years. We need to see some action around this very, very quickly. It cannot continue. I'm not convinced personally that this organization is fit for purpose and able to provide the role, the hugely important role that it needs to provide for, for teachers and our young people in their care. And I am really concerned about what I would have heard today. 
based on uh, the two evidence sessions we've had. I think that's an emerging consensus, William. Um, it's a completely un unacceptable situation for a, a body responsible for the certification of the teaching profession that is responsible for the development and safeguarding of children. So we, we will act swiftly. Members content with those actions for now? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Members, move us on to item eight and correspondence. And perhaps if you'll allow me, um, I think some reference has been made in the media today to correspondence previously received by this committee uh, in relation to uh, a, a primary school, um, uh, Kalinchi Primary School. Um, I, I think it's factually accurate for me to say uh, that the Education Committee takes this matter seriously and referred the parents' correspondence received to the Minister of Education for response and, and signposted parents to the Education Authority curriculum complaints process to ensure that the matter is urgently and appropriately resolved in the best interests of all involved, but particularly pupils at the school. Hopefully members are content with my summary of, of, of that, that factual summary of, of the actions that we took in response to that correspondence. Uh, can I there um, ask the uh, clerk to speak? Sorry, w William, you were trying to speak there. I think you're all, your device is muted. No, it's not. No, it's um, not. Sorry, go ahead. The, the, um, I, uh, I haven't seen the, the media um, piece that you're referring to, but all I would say is this. Um, I think I'd like to hear from, as a governor of school, uh, two schools, I'd like to hear from the education authority around that issue. Okay. But like I say, I, I'm not aware of, of it in detail myself either, but I um, thought it was important that we confirmed the actions that we had taken last week, which I think are are um, proportionate and, and appropriate in terms of referring that correspondence and signposting um, to Education Authority assistance. Education Authority support for the school uh, in its entirety, governors, um, teachers, parents, I think is appropriate to seek that as well, William. Um, okay, Clark, can I ask you to speak to the correspondence for today? Yes, Chair. Um, am I... I'm just checking. I'm not muted. Okay. No, nope, we can hear you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So members, um, correspondence is at page 110. There are 16 items and there's a summary note at page 112 of your packs. Um, item 8.2 on page 115 is a response from the minister um, about his decision on um, the wide debt qualifications. So on the basis of assurances received, the minister has revisited that decision. Um, are members content to note this? Yep, it, I, I suppose it raises question as to why um, it was ever the why Jack uh, qualifications were ever removed as options for school and centres in Northern Ireland in the first place. But hopefully that is a, a resolution that will be helpful for schools and pupils across Northern Ireland. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, could I come in there? Because it, I mean, it, it was one of the first issues I raised after I came on to the committee, if you remember, and uh, I mean. Like everyone else, I'm sure welcome. Uh, who welcomes us? I would, I would join in with that. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. There'll be an opportunity for members to ask Sia about it on the second of June. Um. So, okay. Item eight three on page one one nine is correspondence from the minister about um, uh, his intention to make a written statement to the assembly on the first of June on a fair start, the final report and action plan of the expert panel on educational underachievement. Um. Members, are you content to arrange a briefing with the expert panel as soon as possible? Agreed. Members could come off mute just to make sure that they're 100%, agreed. 100%, sure. Yep. Agreed. Thanks. Right Thank you. Point. Thank you. Item 84 on page 120 is a response from the Minister of Health uh, regarding the vaccination of staff in special schools. To date, 686 invitations have been issued to identified staff and the vaccinations are underway. Are members content to note that? Okay. Yeah, it, it sounds like a, a relatively smaller number of invitations than we would have hoped for, and I'm not sure how expeditious that process has been either, Clark, but noted. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, item 85 is a response from the department um, with an update on the department's work on youth engagement. Um, the committee will be taking briefings on that at its meeting on the 30th of June. Are you con members content to note in the meantime? Agreed. 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 Okay. Um, item 86 on page 127 is correspondence from the department um, with uh, providing copies of the ETI thematic reports on remote learning. Um, the committee's work plan is really full, but it would be very interesting to schedule um, because the committee has looked at remote learning quite a bit um, in pandemic planning. Uh, so do members want to put that in the work plan as soon as we can? Agreed. Thanks, Chair. Um, item 811 is correspondence from the Committee for Finance um, on the establishment of an independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland and the potential role and powers for such a council. And the committee would like feedback from the Education Committee. Um, do members want to ask the department how it sees uh, the fiscal council playing a role initially? I think, I think that's a, a constructive action to take. Agreed. Yeah, Thank agreed. you. Um, item 812 uh, is correspondence from NIPSO. Um, as you'll remember, um, the Ombudsman provided um, her reports on restraint and seclusion last week and a briefing to members in advance of the motion. So are members content to write and thank the Ombudsman for that? Absolutely. Agreed. Yep, agreed. Yep. Agreed. Members, I note very quickly that the, there was some debate when the OFM-DFM committee was originally enacting legislation to create NIPSO around whether education services should be in, included in the remit of NIPSO or not. And I think in hindsight, that was a, a decision that the, the OFM-DFM committee got right on, on that occasion. Okay, Clark. Yep, so just um, one last one. Um, the 814 on page 454 is correspondence from parents about the delivery of speech and language and occupational health services. Um, the committee has already written to the about these and to the EA. So are members content to note that pending a response from um, the trust and the EA? Agreed. Thank you, members. So um, if you're content, we'll dispose of the other correspondence um, as per the summary note at page 112. Agreed, Agreed members. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. okay well, members, time. So. Okay. Agenda Agreed. item nine is for the work programme at page 468. Uh, members content to endorse the Ford Work Programme? Clark, do you have anything to add to the Ford Work Programme? Content to get agreement yeah. for that? If I, yeah, if I may, Chair, um, the Speaker has written to all members and staff to say that recess will begin on July the 10th. Um, so we've got a couple of rejects. On the 16th of June, alongside the Children's Commissioner presenting on SEN, we propose another SEN stakeholder, Children's Law Centre. Um, and that will prepare the committee for its meeting with the department the following week on SEN framework. Um, also, the 23rd, um, there'll be a budget update uh, from officials um, and uh, to reflect the prioritisation um, of underachievement. Um, the 30th of June, um, we would like to invite the expert panel to present on that date and take um, the department's briefing on area planning on the 7th of July. So are members content with those reshuffles? Agreed. Agreed. Chair, can I just raise Robin, yeah. yeah um, we're, we're, we must be approaching the date when the expert panel on underachievement is to be yeah, report to be launched. We've had the interim. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you might have just missed reference to that, Robin. We've we've agreed to invite the the panel to come and brief the committee. No, no problem. But you're you're absolutely right. Obviously, a priority issue for the committee. And my understanding yeah. is the minister's making a statement on that matter on Tuesday. And we, yeah, we we will absolutely invite the panel to come and brief the committee in more detail as as soon as possible. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Okay, Clark. That's forward work program agreed. It is indeed. Any other business? Any other business members? No. No. Okay, members then, the date and time of our next meeting is Wednesday the 2nd of June via Starleaf at 9.30 a.m. The committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.